Christmas, New Year's. New Year's. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How are you, my friend? Great. How's the family? Great. Awesome. Everybody's good, kids? Everybody's good, yeah. Diego yeah. Luna. First day of school back today. So oh, those poor they're, kids. They're a bit of a downer, but but they're doing all right. Oh, my God. There's nothing worse than that, <laughs> is there? Oh, yeah, maybe at the end of summer vacation, <laughs> it gets so bad. Everything good? You know, there's some uh, there's some interesting things going on here, even yeah. outside of the fishing world. I mean, okay. I'm talking about like orcas. Uh, I don't yeah. know if you've been following that at yeah, all, but yeah, yeah, that's a lot of orcas cool. attacking they, gray whales. Still there, I guess. Yeah, right? they're all over the place. I saw the like. one you posted this morning about the sun, the uh, mola mola. Yeah, that eat. was cool, right? Uh, you <laughs> know, I crazy. was waiting for it to eat it. I know, you... I know. I take a bite out of it or something. <laughs> I was like, oh my god, you going to show that? Yeah, that would have been cool. <laughs> and then there was a guy, and I've lost the video, but I don't know if you saw it. A guy, I think it was on the Sport King, that caught some lobster, and they had a octopus. And I think he was the deckhand, and he goes, the guy goes, oh, I want to take that home and eat it. He goes, yeah, no problem. And he, so let's put it out of its misery. He walks up, and he bites it. The octopus? Yeah. What? And he, he goes, now what? He goes, I'm going to bite it right between whatever the it was. Yeah, the eyeballs or something. <laughs> it's funnier than hell. And he goes, now watch it lose its color. I mean, he, he like killed it. Like <laughs> that. That was wild. I got to find that again. If that guy's listening, that would be great. And then, of course, we've seen some good yellowtail fishing down at San Martin. Yeah. Uh, Sean Morgan is uh, obviously in the tequila every day because he's sending me messages like a hundred a day. You know, hey, I'm at the fruit stand. <laughs> but he said a half a mile out of San Jose del Cabo, wide open marlin, great yellowfin, yeah, fantastic weather. Well, I mean, that place down there has been kind of like like the our snowbird type of yeah situation, right? So a lot of the guys up here, I know a lot of the marlin guys, you know, take their families down there for the holidays and things like that, and have some just great great uh, marlin fishing and tuna fishing down there. I mean, a lot of those tournaments, Bisbee's and all that stuff is later in the, you know, in the fall, yeah. stuff like that. And so there's not a good fishing to be had. You know, I mean, obviously we don't get the up-to-date reports except through you, but but uh, it's for guys that just want to get into some more offshore type fishing, pelagics type fishing, that's kind of where it's Have you fished I Cabo? I have it, no. You know what, Sam? Um, this is me, uh, and, and this is just me. The days of Cabo, I mean, it's still a beautiful place, great fishing and everything mm -hmm. else. I'm not, uh, but man, it's just like so touristy now, you know yeah, what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, uh, and well, whatever. Some I'm people sure. like that because I mean, it brings some conveniences and some. Th there's stuff no that, places that are close to there that maybe. Yeah, well, San Jose Lo Cabo yeah. is yeah, and La Paz so, right is big, but it's kind of not as commercial. But mm -hmm. yeah, no, I should not. I'm, I shouldn't do that. Cabo's a great place. It's, it's a different experience, and exactly, I would say that maybe nowadays is more maybe more of a family friendly type of location you know where maybe not everybody has to fish i gotta imagine that's very true 30 40 years ago if you didn't fish you really didn't have much yeah, to do i know so maybe it's a little bit more family friendly not not so much for the hardcore angler yeah as much as other places are and i'm starting to sound like an old man i know i am yeah. because yeah. i drove down there with my brother when we were 18 and 16 and there was literally two hotels and nothing yeah, and yeah. so i'm like pining away for and things change you know so roll with the punches you old fart i'm talking to myself well down there how'd you get leaded fuel um how, how long ago was this <laughs> this was like i want to say this would have been the late 70s yeah i mean there were about that time yeah, yeah there yeah. were pemex stations and yeah. they had just as i remember the 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 road was like two years old and my brother and i like hey you know hey we went to oh, my mom and said hey yeah. do you think we should yeah go for it you know, good luck <laughs> Well, yeah. back then, it probably wasn't a whole lot going on either. You know, uh, it was, the, we never ran into any trouble. Yeah, from yeah. here to there, for sure. And we figured it out rapidly. Like, we caught a sailfish, like, uh, on our first day, and we kept it. And we went to the ch chicken taco stand, and we go, you guys interested in this and feeding us for a week? Yeah. And they're like, yeah, good it. deal. <laughs> so, yeah, we figured out. So, that's all going on. What else? There's been some good surf fishing, although there's been a little bit inclement weather. I know you had the whole 22nd Street landing here today. <laughs> yeah. They probably, Brian told you, there's been some really good bass fishing there. Really good fishing. Yeah, I know, it's, I know a lot, some of those boats are doing boat work right now, so they're not going out. But the guys that are um, are having really good luck. I mean, everywhere, really. I think uh, guys at Marina Del Rey have been doing good. I mean, they've been doing yeah. good for a few months now, it seems like. But even the stuff right out, out here, you know, uh, Horseshoe Cup area, I think they're doing pretty good, too. So. Yeah, they have uh, Michael Limon. You know yeah. Michael? Yeah, yeah, he yeah, had yeah. a limit of sand bass on board the Monte Carlo a couple days ago. Oh, really? Yeah. There you go. Yeah, Brian tutored him, told him, big hook, two-ounce sliding egg, 25-pound fluoro. I made that part up because <laughs> Dan Lightfoot didn't tell me what pound, but I'm thinking that's about right. And uh, they use heavier than that, 30, 40 Yeah, pounds. I know. Yeah. You should actually in that yeah. structure, right? Yeah. But he, he caught a limit of bass, and then there everybody's like, what is that kid doing? And yeah. Brian goes, I'm telling you guys, here, <laughs> rig up like this. And 
And Brian, I got to see him tonight, yeah, so that made my day. I love Brian. Yeah. Uh, those guys must have been hurt here with this with this wind yesterday. Man, that was crazy. Dude, I went down there yeah. just to test these mics in 30 knots wind. They performed great, but yeah, I saw, I, you know, they had a huge crowd of people there. Yeah, what was that about? They were going fishing on oh, the Monte Carlo. Right. But, um, fishing, I mean, but, all yeah. you had to do is look and go. Yeah. This ain't happening today. Yeah, yeah I walked up to Walt, the captain of the Monte Carlo. I go, you're not going fishing, are you? He goes, no. <laughs> I go, I didn't think so. Yeah, they weren't going to get too far. No, but I mean, hey, that's a testament to how good their operation is if you get a big crowd of people yeah. when the weather's like that, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah, 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 Well, last day before kids go back to school, I'm sure. Oh, that had something to do with it. Yeah. To I'm get, not in tune to that kind of yeah, stuff yeah. anymore, so <laughs> like I used to be. Um, so we got uh, a lot of great fishing opportunities. Um, you seem real busy here today. You know, I yeah. know it's a down time of the year, but is, yeah. I walked in and there was a lot of activity, people coming in. Yeah. Yeah. We actually had, you know, I mean, one of the things that we've done a little bit more lately here is, um, try to stock up on some more trout stuff. And so, uh, you know, the trout fishing, you know, we've talked about it on our past shows a little bit has really kind of increased a lot because of so much of, uh, trout, uh, stocking that's happened in a lot of the local lakes. And so it is just something to do in the wintertime, but now we can do it in the city. And so uh, we've been really, really, really busy with that. And we've got all the power bait, all the small oh, great. jigs that, they, that people buy for that kind of stuff, rods and wheels, <clears throat> even rod building stuff. I know today we probably sold four blanks uh, for trout fishing, you know, which is something that, I mean, five years ago, we didn't even carry a trout fishing That's blank, great. You know? That's so great. It's just a testament to the, you know, our, our community and how willing they are to, Adapt. adapt you yeah, know? right. Like, well, if I can't do this, I'm going to do this other thing. Rockfish is closed right yeah. now. Well, let's, go, let's go trout fishing. And the trout fishing is good. That's the other part because of the, the, the stocking. Is, is it? So is it? Has it been good? It's been good. I yeah. mean, repeatedly I get guys. I mean, I went the first day we tried to go fish laundry. We didn't catch anything. But here the last uh, couple of weeks, we've definitely been hearing about a lot of guys, you know, being pretty consistent as far as going down there and catching a fish or, or more. Uh, I went to Kenneth Hound Park that one morning. And uh, we caught some fish over there. That was a couple of weeks ago. I'll probably go out again this weekend and uh, go somewhere. I'm not sure where, but uh, to, you know, go try and catch some trout. But, you know, just something to do. I mean, it's, you know, there's lots of fishing to be had, but that trout fishing, it's new for me. And I get to take out Diego and, and Luna, uh, you know, try something different as That's well. That's awesome. So yeah. Just another reason to, to go fishing. Perfect. Yeah. You want me to catch up on Let's some go. of these yeah, comments? We'll catch here. up on some of these comments. Welcome, everybody, to Free Minute Adventures, Tackle Shop Confessions, live from... Right here, Island Fishing Tackle in beautiful Carson, California. You've got to come by. Everybody who comes by this place, uh, Jolene Thompson. Whoa, the inventory is so massive, yeah. and it's a great store. She so. was cool. Hope you can come by. All right, Patrick Harnjack up there in Montana. He says, hello and happy New Year, Sam. Happy New Year. Scott Buchert sends us 25 big dollars. Way Sam, to get started, Scott. We're getting Thank close you. to yeah. having dinner now yeah. almost, right? <laughs> a couple more of those, and we'll be good. There's Isaac saying... Happy New Year, gentlemen. Glad to have you back. Let the show begin. And Isaac's son, Owen, is seven years old today. So happy nice. birthday, Owen. Happy birthday. Really cool. Uh, 540 Slinger, Jeff. I haven't heard from you for a while. Jeff Yeoman. Jeff, it's always good to hear from you. Good evening, Phil. Sam Friedman, about your family. Happy New Year. And, of course, Dan Smith and his lovely wife, Kim. Hello, Phil, Sam, and all of you watching. Happy New Year, and I hope... Your week is off to a great start. Joel Lopez. Hey, Phil and Sam, hope you're having a good one. Man, we got way too Always. many nice people surrounding us, you know? Really good stuff. Uh, let's see. Peter. Peter Cepeda. Can't wait for our eight-day trip in November on the Independence. I can't either, man. Should be a good one. Really. Actually, I have a waiting list on that now. Awesome. We have a five-day, April 4th through the 9th on the Independence, man. Uh, there's some spots open on that. We would love to have you there. Carlos Mosquera, who's another great guy. Gentlemen, happy new super year. He's a super great guy. Uh, Sam, thanks again for the help with the rod components the other day. I love Carlos, man. Yeah, yeah. He fished. Cool I fished with him uh, on the Apollo on a two-day trip. Okay. Just had such a good time with him. Robert Graber, good evening, Phil and Sam. A happy new year to Tackle Shop Confession starts tonight. Wahoo! Yeah, man. <laughs> People are missing this show. I'm telling you. <laughs> They have no taste. I don't know if we're going to get the game or not. <laughs> yeah. yeah, really. Hey, can you kind of cool the uh, comments? We want to see the end of the game. 17-3, let us know what the score of that college football game is. All right, uh, Isaac um, says that they do that in Hawaii when they die for octopus. Bite the head to kill it. Well, they All got right. you for sure. You, yeah, it was you, good stuff. You knew what it was doing. 
David Rosenthal, another great guy. He says, good evening, Phil, Sam, and the entire FAA family. Always great to hear from you, David. Sean Sarkisian, yeah. he is, of course, the gentleman from La Fogata in Sherman Oaks. And we will be at La Fogata from 1 to 3 in the afternoon on January 21st. Sam has something else going on. Do you notice, everybody, <laughs> that every time I plan an event, Sam has something going on? You have yet once to check with me before you plan the event to see if I have something. Uh, going I'm on. sorry. <laughs> you don't need to be sorry. Uh, uh, that's the reason. I'm truly sorry. <laughs> that breaks my heart. All right, we'll get him out at one of these one of these times. But that's going to be a great event. Uh, Sean, great to see you here. What does uh, Sean mean in Armenian? Do you know? I don't know. He's, I, I wonder if he's just impressed with me. He told me, and I've never forgot. Lightning. Lightning. Yeah, I that's like cool. that, man. Well, that's a great name. Uh, PNS Harnjack. I am in the market for a new tackle bag. Can you possibly show off a few of the popular tackle bags? Compare them. I want an SKB box, but it's a little above my price point right now. Sure. So when we get down a few here, I'll, I'll remember. Okay, yeah, so I'll run. Go ahead and start reading them. And not okay, and then if it's a technical question that I can't answer, I'll wait for you. You got it. Otherwise, I can handle the greetings. Tim Marquez, hey, Sam and Phil. Tim, thank you so much. We met Tim yesterday. If you watched the morning briefing today, everybody, you saw Tim. You saw Greg Bates. Tim came down with a truck full of great stuff for Mexico. By the way, Greg Bates and I, Tim, will be heading down to Mexico this weekend with a big load. We're going to get a load of stuff down there and shoot some video, um, trying to put together also. Um, I'll, I'll just tell you this while Sam's running around over there. There is a guy, he owns... Uh, the uh, hotel in Ensenada. Como se llama este hotel? It's the French restaurant. In fact, it's the oldest French restaurant in the Republic of Mexico, uh, El Rey Sol. Anyway, he told me one time, he goes, Phil, I know you do a lot of stuff for kids and families and everything, but there is an old people's home near Ensenada, and those people get no visitors and no love. And So I, Sam might have even heard me. Sam, back me up on this. I was leaving jean Lou a message just a moment ago, and I go, hey, I'm coming down to Ensenada, bringing a bunch of stuff down, going to shoot some videos. Where is that old people's home? So I'm going to try to run that down and uh, see what we uh, can do to uh, say hi to those folks. That would be nice. Tim, thanks again for all you do. Chris Navarro, Happy New Year, Phil and Sam. I am Chris. Great to see you, man. Thank you so much. Fernando Hernandez, haven't seen the live podcast since last year. It's been a long time. You're right, man. Um, glad to see the show rolling, fellas. Keep it up, Fernando. Thank you so much for your great support. Chris Navarro. Let me get back there. Man, there's a lot of comments here, guys. Thank you so much. Sam, are you going on the June Royal Star Trip this year? Are you on the June Royal Star Trip, Sam? That's a maybe. Okay. They can hear you, by the way. So I know. That's a maybe. You That's know. That's a maybe. Yeah, don't say anything about me while you're sneaking around over there. Oh, I already said a whole bunch. Oh, my God. Don't <laughs> listen to them, everybody. Please. Please don't listen to them. All right, uh, Joel Lopez, if you have only one option for one budget setup for Bluefin that can nighttime jig and fly line, if need be, what would it be? You want to answer that one first? Yeah, we get sure. In? Man, oh. you got a ton of bags, by yeah, the way. Yeah. You're going to get your money's was, worth there, Patrick. I was looking for another one that I think I'm out of right now. but um, So, let me see here. One for night, if you know, the fly line part of it, you're really looking on two different sides here. So we're going to, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I don't know if you're looking for one rod and reel that can do both, but um, you really are going to be at two different ends of the spectrum because with bluefin fishing, a lot of times you're fishing 25, 30 pound test uh, for daytime fly line fishing. And then at night you're going to be fishing with like a hundred pound test. And so they're so far apart that you really can't do both with one. <laughs> um, but that being said, you know, as far as your nighttime fishing, you really can't go wrong with either a, uh, as far as the reel, uh, a fathom, uh, the larger fathom, 60 or 80, even maybe the 40. And then um, in the Shimano, they have the Speedmaster uh, 20 and 25. So that's going to be on your jigging nighttime setup. Um, and you can definitely use it for daytime fly line, but really maybe down to about 50 pound test, maybe would be about the lightest that you can really effectively fly line. Obviously, you can tie whatever leader you want on there. But because of the weight of the spool and just how large the rod and reel is going to be, maybe it wouldn't be proper for, let's say, 25 pound. 
But in those same lines, you know, both the Fathom and the Speedmaster, they do offer a reel that's small enough. And I'd probably go with either a size 25 narrow um, on the Fathom and a size like 12 on the Speedmaster. And that'll get you down to about 25 pound test up to about 40 pound test daytime fly line fishing. And that would complement your heavier rig that would lead you right from 50 pound fly line on up to like 60 or 80 pound fly line. As far as your rods, there's going to be a couple different choices to be had, um, all in the 200 to $300 range. You know, Dial makes a couple, uh, you know, Graftech <laughs> makes a couple, um, uh, Okuma makes a couple. And so you want to look at something that is appropriate for that line size for, for, for that. But uh, that's going to be it. You know, I mean, as far as finding one that's going to do it all, unfortunately, I'm going to have to say you can't really do it all with one. Just because it's too far, they're too far apart. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you want one more real question, or do you want to handle the I bags? Think, or? Yeah, let's just do that next week. I think that's okay. another real question. There. Yeah, it is. Um, let's see, is it Joe Lopez or who is it? Robert. Uh, Robert yeah, Slager. Robert Slagers. Right, Robert. Uh, hey, Phil and Sam. Uh, conventional reel that you would select to fly line a sardine on twenty-five pound for BFT. Yeah, I think that's kind of where we left off there, and. You know, that 25-pound test and, and bluefin tuna in general, you know, sometimes you get into a situation in which somebody will come to me and ask me exactly that. And a lot of times what I'll ask them is right back is what else do they have? And the reason I'll ask them that is that 25-pound reel might need to also do, like I was uh, explaining for Joel, is it might also need to do 40-pound and 30-pound as well. But let's just say you already have a solid 40-pound setup and you wanted to have something that was more of a finesse setup, you know, for 25-pound test. I would go with um, something that would be in that next class down where on the Speedmaster, Talica would be like a size 10. On the Fathom, you'd be like into a size 15. Um, but then you can go on from there. Even in the, uh, the Saltigo reels, you'd be into about a size 30. And so that basically that smaller profile, the smallest profile, maybe the wider of the smallest profile uh, reels is what I would go for a reel on those. Um, and that should that should perform real good. One of the things you have to remember too is that 25 pound test doesn't always mean you're fishing for a smaller fish. Sometimes you're just trying to get a bite. And so sometimes fishing 25 pound, you're fishing point. a 25, 30 pound fish average, but sometimes it might be an 80 pound average yeah. with a couple of hundred pounders mixed in. And so if that's the case, that's where you're going to need to probably step up to that next size up. Like I was talking to Joel about and fishing 25 pound on maybe one of those bigger reels that has more line on it. So line capacity can be an issue. Because you get a fish, you can't pull as hard, you can't put as much a drag, meaning that it's going to take longer for that fish to stop. So that's that's, that's a really good point. Kind of because a way to look at that too. So many bites I was witnessing this year were mixed fish. Mm -hmm. You may hook a hundred pounder, you may hook a twenty five pounder, yeah. and man, if you hook a hundred pounder, you want to have, you know, I mean, if you have to drop your line down to get a bite, I get that, but you want to write the right gear, yeah. right? And sometimes I'll get a question too: is like, well, do I really need a two speed for twenty five <clears> pound? And you don't need it the first hour. But after the third or fourth hour you're on that fish, you definitely would appreciate it. Yeah. So <laughs> on a 25-pound fish, definitely you don't. But you hook a 100-pounder, that 25-pound is going to feel like you're pulling on 80-pound. You're just so tired after a while. So, you know, I, I would say, no, you don't need it. The reel is not going to fall apart if you don't have it, that kind of thing. But you're definitely going to be on the fish longer. And so as we all know, too, is the longer you're on a fish, the more, you know, the chances. More that can go wrong. Something that can go wrong. So Yeah, for yeah. sure. Uh, Peter Cepeda says his first long-range trip ever is in November with us on the Independence. Awesome. It's going to be great, Peter. You're going to love the boat. It is so beautiful. The crew's great. And uh, myself and Scott Buchert is, yeah, do you yeah. know, he's on that trip. Really? On the eight-day? He's on the five-day and the eight-day. Oh, man. 13 days of that guy on the boat. Oh, my God. Yeah. <laughs> if I don't start drinking again, it'll be a miracle. <laughs> and he's got me bartending a margarita bar. Really? Yeah, he goes, I'll buy all the margarita stuff, everything. Jeez. I want to go top notch and then treat everybody to a margarita wow. day. So yeah, do that trip. That's very nice of him, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. That's pretty cool. Yeah, we probably if you want, you know, I can <laughs> well I can have him have it in the parking lot before we yeah. leave. You can come down and get a motel. That'd be pretty cool. Do you want to do the bags or I'm gonna keep going? Yeah, I'll do the bags okay. if we get too far here. We'll get to your questions, yeah. everybody. There's a whole bunch more. But Sam had a question from Patrick Hornjack in Montana, and uh, I'll t let you take it away, Sam. And I was going to mention something to Peter there is if, I'm not sure where he lives, but uh, if you have a chance to go to these you know, tackle shows coming up, I would definitely recommend it. If it's going to be your first trip, long range trip, be an eight day trip, you know, go down and talk to the boats, you know, really get a one on one with the actual captains of the boats and, and really get Great an idea, idea for what, what you're going to need. 
You know, that's going to be the big question. Sometimes we go a little crazy, you know, we buy way too much or we buy, we buy way too much of the wrong stuff. Or on the other end, we don't take enough. And I've seen it both, you know, on, on our long range trips, I've seen guys that just take most of the time, take too much. way too much stuff. Yeah. Most of the time. Yep. But I've also seen where, man, they're missing this and they're missing that. And, you know, if you're good with with the boat and, and maybe the boat is able to accommodate that, sometimes that, that happens. But sometimes they don't really know that you're missing something until like two or three days into the trip. And now you might have missed out on a possible opportunity. So you know, my recommendation, if you have a chance, go down to these shows and, uh, and talk to them one-on-one. -on -one. Take a list of what you have and, uh, and maybe even a list of, you know, rods and reels and all that kind of stuff. And really start getting it dialed in, you know, and, and also basically would be a good opportunity to buy some stuff too. You're going to get the good deals of the show, but yeah, for sure. Talk Brad Hall show, yeah. January 25th Fifth. through the 28th. And then we'll be announcing the other shows as they come up. Yeah. yeah. Pacific coast or what Pacific coast, the uh, sword fishing so show. It, and... It'll be, uh, the next show after that's going to be Del Mar. So that'll be down there the week, uh, after, uh, Valentine's day. So Valentine's is well, the 14th. So I think it starts on the 15th or 16th. And then goes on, I believe, to the 18th or 19th or something like that, that weekend. So that'll be the next show. That'll be at Del Mar. Near San Diego, Barton in Hall. case you're coming to us from some other part of the world. And then the last show is going to be uh, March 7th, uh, PCS show. It'll be here at the Orange County Fairgrounds. Yeah. Your stomping grounds. Yeah, it's my stomping grounds, yeah, yeah. for sure. Oh, man. What? Hold on. Let me make sure I have to answer this call here. All right. Sam's running over. I'm going to uh, say, uh, I'm going to read a couple more comments. Emmanuel Nabello. Good evening, uh, guys. Hi from Florida. Same. Emmanuel, say hi to my son, Patrick. He's there in Florida with no, you. Great to see no. you here, my friend. Joe Lopez, question for Phil. The off season is approaching. Are we going to get more okay. captain and deckhand interviews? Throwback to those black and white yeah, thumbnails. Yeah, yeah. Joel, you read okay. my mind, man. Yeah, absolutely. Because, I mean, you figured it out. I can't get those guys a lot of the times. I don't know whether I should make this announcement now or not, but I can't get those guys because they're on the boat. You know, they're doing their thing. I'm going to make this announcement too. Uh, so, you know, this is the time to do it. Yeah, we're going to definitely sit down. In fact, let me tell you, Joel, um, Glenn Mueller, he used to run the Redondo special. His brother Chris ran the Re city of Redondo. Both those guys, we've lined them up. They've got all kinds of photos and everything else. They're going to be some of the first ones we do. So... We're looking forward to that. No, I won't make the announcement. I'll let Sam take over now. Very impressive, be, Sam. It's going to be a long one. You want to make a quick announcement? Or no, I don't. I'm good. good. All right. So I'm not sure if this last one is in frame here, but this is kind of an example of a small, medium, large. So that's the first question is how big of a bag do you want? But for uh, Patrick, I'm pretty sure he's looking for like a long range style bag. So we're probably going to look on the larger size. But just as an idea, normally the differences are um, like these, these are three bags from Africa. They're actually really nice bags. It's going to be the amount and the size of trays that they fit. So this one here fits four trays, smaller size. This would be kind of more your, you know, up to an overnight trip maybe. Although, you know, as we've said so many times, these local overnight trips has been so crazy now that before something like this would be perfect enough for a three day trip. Yeah. Well, an overnight trip, you know, this might be a little small, but for the right guy, and maybe if you're not targeting big tuna, Something like this would probably be good up to an overnight trip. So yeah. this is going to be your smaller size. This is an AFCO bag, pretty nice one. And then you get your medium size here. This is going to be the more average size that you're going to find a lot of. And it'll fit the, what they call 3,600 size trays, which is kind of like the medium size trays. And normally this is about the same deal. It holds about four. And all of them are going to have like a kind of a, a, a top open storage. And this is the one from AFCO there. It's a really nice one. And then AFCO has the next larger one here. And, and that's kind of what you'll normally find would be the next larger one here where it basically fits the 3,700 size trays, which that's like basically the bigger trays. Also has a big open top. You're also going to find usually some size, some side bags that are pretty sizable on these. You can fit some large items, maybe like even like a jacket or something like that. But uh, really, really big. So these are going to hold a lot here. Yeah. Man, that's sizable. It's pretty big. And it can get pretty heavy. Obviously, you get it loaded down. Are these things pretty durable? Um, yeah. I mean, usually the Achilles heel on all of these soft bags is yeah. going to be the zippers. Okay. There are some things that you can do preventative. Is They, they, they actually sell um, in the luggage stores. They call, it's called zipper wax. And basically, it's just a, like a chapstick. And so you basically rub it right on here onto the, onto the zipper before you go take it on, on a boat. 
And I've that, seen that, Scott use that on his Levi's. Yeah, <laughs> Zipper Wax. Yeah. So, so yeah, you'll use that um, to, to protect it. But but even that, I think it's kind of a limited thing. They're not going to last forever. Um, but, you know, if you take care of it and you don't, you know, soak it in salt water and hopefully you're on a trip that's good weather and it does, does not full of salt water, they do last a few years. But don't be surprised if they only last a few years. Okay. So it's it's one of those things. That's just natural to zippers. Nobody makes their own zipper. They're using something else. Yeah. Here's another one here from Daiwa. This is going to be another type of storage here. Now, this guy here, some guys really like and some guys really don't like him. Um, same kind of deal it holds. This is a 3,700 size tray here. Pretty big. Now, these are kind of like more of the drop-in style um, storage. The bad part about this is that depending on what kind of tackle you have, sometimes, you know, it, it'll all kind of get like uh, off to one side or if, or if the trays themselves are not like uh, designed real well, that you can get the tackle that kind of like migrates from one compartment to oh, another. yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's because it's on the boat and there's vibration and yeah. stuff like that. So yeah. it happens. The, the upside to this kind of bag is that it uses a very small footprint. Yes. So this bag here holds pretty much the same amount of tackle as this bag here. Wow. And so looking at that, it's pretty nice, yeah. especially if you're on a boat that's kind of crowded yeah, or something like that. Or maybe you might have two of these bags, you know, and you have that much tackle and you need to put one upstairs and maybe one in your stateroom. I don't know, depending on, on what you're doing. Yeah. So this is going to hold a lot of tackle in a small area. But just so you know that, that the actual storage of the boxes is, can sometimes be not as ideal, but, um, but compact is kind of the ideal with this guy here. That's amazing that those two bags hold exactly the same. You never guess that looking no, at them, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's just the design of it, you know? Yeah. Um, the next kind of category is your backpack style. Now, these here is something that I never had growing up, but nowadays this is kind of a norm. Um, same type of configuration as the first style where it's basically going to be a stack or a shelf style system just like that shows there. This is aft goes right here. I think theirs is probably looks a little nicer, but... Same kind of deal where it's got, you know, you'll see the, the storage. And normally these are going to be a 3,700 size. I mean, sorry, 3,600 size, which is kind of the medium size trays. And the, and it's generally the same kind of deal where it's got an open storage on top. And it has um, a side bag here. Though, um, one thing I did see different, um, actually, uh, when, uh, when, you know, Wendy Tochihara? Of course. So she, uh, she, she's a, a rep for SKB. And she brought back, she brought by a, uh, uh, a new bag that they have that has, uh, it's a backpack, but yet also has wheels. Oh, wow. Yeah. So that's kind of the first bag of that type. That's nice. Yeah. Yeah. And that's the bag that I was looking for. That's why it took me a little while to get, get over here. The SKB one? No, no. Oh. So, um, the other, the, the third category of bag oh, right. which we're out of is, is, is the one that has wheels. So basically nowadays that's a very popular style of bag. Because, uh, especially with these knife jigs, you know, you get a lot of weight. Yeah. And so, God, it's like um, some of these friggin' bags, man. Oh, 100 pounds. Brutal. Easy. Yeah. Easy. And, and uh, you know, but that's that's just the way it is. You're on a three or four day trip. You know, you're going to need all the different sizes, you know, 200, 300, 400, 500 gram jigs. And, you know, 500 grams is over a pound. So it's, it, it, you know, you get 10 of those 10 pounds just in jigs. You know, no hooks, no sinkers, no nothing. So yeah, they can get pretty heavy. And if you're fishing out of a, if you're fishing out of a landing and you're on a long range trip where you're going to use the dock cart, it's not a big deal because you go right from your trunk or your back of your car, right into a dock cart. So you never really have to to carry that bag. Yeah. But if you're somewhere where they don't have dock carts and you have to possibly walk from a parking lot spot a couple hundred yards, that might be a lot of weight. You know, especially you might have another bag that um, maybe with your clothing or something like that if you're on a multi day trip. It can be kind of hard to carry all your tackle all at once. So those, those, uh, those rolling tackle bags have become super popular. Um, the only downside to those is that they are a little bit bigger, a little bit bigger footprint, um, and then also the wheels. Depending on how far they have to travel, you know, they're not going to be you know bulletproof wheels, but they do pretty good. Um, but that's one thing you have to be mindful of is if you have to go over a really really rough uh, parking lots and things like that, they may not last as long. And they also have the zippers as well. But uh, the other plus side to those, though, that's kind of cool is that norm, uh, most of them have rocket launchers. Oh, that's cool. So that is kind of nice to paint on. What boat you're on, some, some yeah. boats you can use that, some boats you can't. But the boats that you can, having rods right where you do your rigging 
is very, very convenient. So you could have your four rods there, rig up those four rods and have everything all in one place instead of having to lean them somewhere or, or doing something like that. So that's your basically four, four categories. Basically the price, is, uh, the low end and high end on all those things. You're probably well, going to be at around, around for the medium, the larger sizes, starting at about a hundred bucks. And you get into the larger bags. I think that that new SKB one is going to be, gosh, don't quote me on this, but I think it was around two, 200 and some change maybe, with a lot of the other bags being around 140 to 180. So depending on how many features you want and what style you want, you're going to be paying anywhere from um, you know 100 bucks to, to 200 bucks, I would say. Um, I think those drop-in style ones, the ones that I was showing you with a small footprint, those you can find sometimes as cheap as like 40, 50 bucks. There's some off-brand ones, and especially in that uh, fresh water, you'll, you'll see one from Flambeau or from maybe Ugly Stick or whatever that just has their name attached to it. Yeah. They're basically just a duffel bag. Yeah. You know, but they're, 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 they're made in a way in which they're kind of square that those boxes will fit in there. So there's not a whole lot of sewing to them. So I know that once in a while you'll find those cheaper out there. Um, but, uh, uh, but that's that style only. Everything else that has a shelving type system is going to be a little bit more expensive. Dave Sanderson from SKB. Do you ever meet him? I haven't. I've heard of he's him. He's the owner. So yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I haven't seen him for 10 years, but he's a super great guy. And we used to chat all the time. I got to run him down. So maybe Wendy, I can figure out how oh, to yeah. contact him. I'm yeah. sure she knows him. Super yeah. great guy. Really good. And what a product. I mean, talk about indestructible, yeah. right? Well, that's the other flip side, too. I know he mentioned he didn't have the budget for the uh, <clears throat> SKB yeah. box. And I know being out of town, he probably doesn't do as many of those big trips. But I will say this on that SKB. Um, you got it for life. Pretty it's much. for life. Yeah, I, mean, I have one. Uh, I have two of them. I actually have the larger one and the smaller one, and I've had those things for 15 years, and they're as functional as they're ever going to be. Um, they hold more than enough tackle for sure. I will say they don't hold as as much tackle as a comparable soft bag of the same footprint size, but it'll definitely last forever. Yeah, it, you'll you'll never need another box. You know, and actually, I think they have a lifetime warranty. I think they do. Yeah. yeah. So if, if you were to somehow drop it and break it, they'll either fix it or replace it for free. That's great. So it's something that depending keep on, mind. you keep that in mind too. But yeah, they're, they're like in the $500 range. Yeah. Like that. Yeah. Isaac Parcells sends us 20 bucks with Woo. a super chat saying, you are amazing, Isaac. Thank you so much, Sam and I are edging closer to being able to eat once again, Sam. <laughs> I can't believe it. Omar, good evening, Jets. Is trout fishing more of a bait and wait, or do they hit jigs? Omar, good to see you. Definitely um, hit the jigs for sure. You know, uh, you know, there's there's, there's kind of like two schools of that. Just like for saltwater fishing, in a way, there's the bait guys and the jig guys. You know, but uh, I, I would say as far as just the percentage, I'm sure there's more fish caught on bait. You know, the power bait and the the, the, the doe bait type baits. There's probably more fish caught on that than anything else, and night crawlers and that kind of stuff. But um, but that that mini jig stuff is really really taken off, and you know I, I would say as we, as far as even in our store we, we're probably about fifty fifty as far as the guys who use one and the other. Um, a lot of this stalker trout will eat a mini jig just fine, but uh, but I would say your bait and weight is probably the most effective. You know you have that two rod stamp that you buy with your license. Yeah. What a lot of guys do, they'll set one out. You know, with a bait, with the power bait, you know, the floating power bait, and throw a jig, and they'll throw a jig right next to it, and, yeah, and uh, just to kind of keep you active, something to do. But they'll, you know, when I the, the one time that I went, we were just using those mini jigs that we we're actually using the small hookah baits, and we caught fish, and that that's probably the way I'll just keep doing it. But uh, but I know that most of the guys that do it and have the most success probably are the the bait and weight guys. Yeah, my brother and I a million years ago fished a lake, I think near Shasta called Lake Siskiyou. We had no clue what we were doing. We had little mini jigs. We went down to this lake, and there was absolutely nobody there and made a cast. Whoa! <laughs> it was like throwing the iron. Yeah, it and is, we it were is. just freaking hammering yeah. these things, man. It's it was fun. Like, it's it fun. was fun. Yeah, yeah. It really was. So, yeah, good stuff. All right, um, let's see. Joel Lopez. Hey, Sam, besides Taddy and Salas, what are your favorite Imrons? So I, I, I would say, I mean, those JRIs probably mm -hmm. offer a, a good assortment. There's a lot of other jigs out there. You kind of like the CNC. kicker jig once in a while? Kicker or, jig's am I right or not? Too? Yeah, yeah, that's a good one. Um, we have we have those. Mm -hmm. they, they basically only have like four styles. Um, but those uh, JRIs, they have more styles. So I, and that's one of the things I like is being able to buy a whole bunch of different ones, you know? Yeah. But uh, If this one doesn't work, this yeah, one will. Yeah, you yeah. want to go down there with a bunch of bullets, you know? Yeah. But uh, I know there's a lot of CNC jigs out there too that are pretty good. Those OCT jigs and 
and a whole bunch of other ones. But uh, but that JRI is probably the next closest one, and and then those uh, kicker jigs as well, are pretty good. All right, good stuff. Hey, don't forget to hit that like button, everybody. Deeply appreciate you being there. Follow us on Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, Apple Podcast, and Spotify. It's always good to have you all here. Uh, Joe Lopez says, yellows are boiling. What jig are you picking up first, and what setup are you taking off the rod holder? Most, Forkies are up. They're boiling. Yeah, most likely to be a, a Taddy 45. That's probably my number one go-to jig, Taddy 45. Mm -hmm. I mean... Definitely have a lot of other jigs that have caught a lot of fish, but if you, if, you know, the question really is going to be if you had to take one jig, what would you take, right? Because I'm going to have about 50 jigs with me every time I go, and I'll switch them out back and forth a whole bunch of times. But, but that Taddy 45, as far as a rod and reel, it'll probably be Calstar nine or ten foot rod, um, or even you know, depending on on if I'm in the mood, even a United Composites. You know, they have that 9E and the 10E. You know, I mean, it's so hard to choose. I got about 40 jig rods, and every time I go fishing, I take a couple. Real is, real is still probably going to be a Trinidad 20. That's still kind of my go-to as far as that. Dude, have you seen the freaking barred perch I've been putting on the morning briefing for Baja? For Baja, yeah. Damn, they're freaking, yeah. you see those <laughs> things? Like three-pound slabs. I mean, they got to be pretty close to a, like a world record, I'm sure. Some oh, of those. Darn, man, yeah. that's fun. Yeah, yeah I think it. the world record is Fred Oakley. Yeah. I think it was four pounds something. That's giant. It's hanging up in, uh, what's the name of that tackle place? In Malibu. Uh, Wiley's? Yeah, Wiley's. Okay. Yeah, it's in there. Hmm. That frickin' Fred Oakley. I knew him as a really? kid. Great fisherman. But I told you, I caught that frickin' uh, yellowfin croaker on Pat St. Patrick's Day in Surfside. Oh, that's right. That's and right. it measured the same length Bad. as his world record bullshit. Uh, pardon me. <laughs> Except it didn't weigh as much. And I got sick of jumping through hoops, going, trying to get it certified and all this. So I gave it to a Cambodian donut <laughs> shop to the girls there. So here, have a great meal with this yeah, thing. Yeah. So, but yeah, Fred Oakley, man, yeah, it's amazing. I had all kinds of like local records, right? Yeah, he Casting was amazing. Yeah, and... he used to come out on the Redondo special. He was a little kind of um, for a kid, like a young kid like me, intimidating. Like mm -hmm. he didn't smile that much. He was very intense and all about catching fish, and he was mm. good at it, man. Mm. So you know, you could watch him and copy him. Yeah, yeah. And learn a lot. You so. don't want to get in his way, though. Yeah, no, sure. you stay out of his way. <laughs> Dan Lightfoot says, Happy New Year, Phil and Sam, and Free Bit Adventures family. Dan Lightfoot, I told you he was out with Michael and the Monte Carlo, limits of Sam Bass for those guys. And he just sent me a photo of Mitchell, who goes as halibut man. He contributes here all the time. 31-inch, nice big flatty, fishing off berth 55 at the wow. docks today. 31-incher, so, huh? 31-incher, nice. man. Beautiful fish. Nice going, Mitchell. What did you catch it on? I didn't get that. Dan never, you know what? Dan's the worst reporter in the world. <laughs> he'll, you know, he'll say, look what so-and-so caught. And I'm like, do I seriously have to go yeah. through what was it caught on? Where was yeah. it caught? How big was it? <laughs> I can, ah! <laughs> Just give me, give me the freaking info. I don't, it's like pulling teeth. So impatient, this guy. Yeah, I know. I'm sorry, Dan. <laughs> I'm a little stressed out, obviously. You right? are, yeah. yeah. I have all my money on uh, uh, Washington. <laughs> Washington. <laughs> yeah. I had it on Notre Dame, so you know how that went. <laughs> all right, Dan, thanks. So uh, great to see you here. Andre Amado, good evening. What's tonight's topic, man? It's whatever Everybody, you want yeah. it to be <laughs> right now. Uh, tonight's topic is, can we get this show over and uh, quickly enough so we can go watch the second half? And That's a the tough answer one, is man. no. Over and under, yeah. Andre, good to see you here. Doug Tilt. Doug is a great guy. Brought all those chickens to our Christmas party. Oh, okay. Such a generous guy. Halftime score, Mich whoa, Michigan 17, Washington 10. Coming back. Mm. They scored on that. Bye, yeah. everybody. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sam and I are going to eat chicken wings if we get a couple more super chats. Scott Buchert. Sam, on your five-day trip. That's right. You know what that means? Yeah. What does it mean? I don't know. <laughs> it has something to do with that zipper stuff you were, uh, I think he's starting to inhale it. He's saying you're on the five-day trip, I think. Oh, you're on it. That's oh, he's, he's asking that's you. That's what he's asking. Are you on it? I don't think so. You don't do anything no. with us. Man. <laughs> that tells you, man. When's that trip again? Oh, that's right. I'm busy. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's right after the uh, You know what it is? The it's actually, La Fogata. It's April 7th. Yeah, what are you doing because April 7th? Is it your anniversary? Birthday. Oh, yeah, yeah. Do you actually do something for your sister's well, birthday? I don't want to just rule it out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you can tell you'd be back on the 9th with a bunch of fish for a birthday could be, party. Could be. All right, maybe, Scott. We'll see. We'll see. Uh, Andre is back with us. Amado, what's a good white sea bass setup? You know, typically you're going to be into a eight to nine foot rod, uh, something probably rated like a 20 to 50, something like that. Not super heavy. And, and, uh, the reel doesn't have to be very big, but something like a, um, 
you know, a, a Saltis 35, a, you know, a Trinidad 16, something on that size or so. You know, those fish aren't really known for, for being big brutes. Um, but one of the things you have to remember is that at times with the sea bass is you get yellowtail as well. So you want to kind of like make sure that it's a good quality rod, eight to nine foot, and a reel that'll hold about 300 yards of 50 pound braid will probably be about right. Perfect. Isaac says, go get some wings. You're not going to have to <laughs> twist our arms tonight. Anybody in the neighborhood, Sam and I will be over at SoCal Wings. Is SoCal that Wings, yeah. SoCal Wings around 7.30-ish? I would say. Yeah, yeah something yeah. like that. Right as soon as the game's over. Yeah. You can come over. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> if, if you'd like to join us, we'd love to have you over. That'd be great. Um, Shant Sarkisian from La Fogata. January 21st, 1 to 3 p.m. in Sherman Oaks. We will be there, my friends. Come over and join us. What is a good <clears throat> rod to match up with my Phantom 40 and Sam? So really, you know, kind of like going back to the same question before, it really depends on where that falls in your lineup. If that's going to be your biggest rig, then you're going to want something on the heavier side, something where the line rating is going to end at around 100, so 60 to 100, 50 to 100, something like that. If it's going to be something that's going to be more in the middle, maybe you already got like a, let's say, International 16 or something like that, and you're going to be fishing 50 or 60 pound, you want something that's rated more like in the 30 to 60, 50 to 80, something around there. Um, so it really kind of depends on what you're going to be doing. Um, I, I prefer like a United Composite, let's say a, a Predator, or even a, uh, I have one of the uh, Torque 40 Narrows, and I fish it on the uh, rail rod there, the, uh, the Raptor, 7 foot 6 Raptor. I really like that setup, and I like that rod too. It's kind of a heavier rod, but I kind of like that more old school feeling, a rod that just has a little bit more weight to it. But, um, but any rod in that kind of class is probably where I would go. All right, very good. Um... Isaac wants to know, Sam, do those fish bags have any type of warranty? My zipper broke on the roller large size. Not really. I mean, it's usually about a year, and you know, normally they'll they'll, they'll break about a year and a week, is about is about the limit. But you know, they, they usually don't break. It's usually something that we that we break. You know, sometimes, um, <clears throat> you know, uh, just because like I was saying earlier, the rust kind of gets to them, or they get stuck in a certain spot, and we're trying to move them past that spot, and, and they'll they'll open up or something like that. But, uh, but yeah, they do have warranties, but it's usually within a year, a one-year warranty, or might even be less. I'd have to look on the tags, depending on what your brand is that you got. But uh, uh, one of the things, if, if you really like the bag that you're using and you like it and it's working out for you, you might want to go to like maybe a, a place that might sew one up. You know, there's, there's luggage re you know, repair places and things like that. I've, heard, I've had a few customers do that. It's not that bad. I think, I think they told me about 40 bucks is what they charged them, and they put a heavier-duty zipper in that, in that spot. So... You might look into that, but uh, depending on what brand you have, normally it's a year or less as far as the warranty. All right, hit that like button, everybody. Appreciate you being here. Thank you so much for the super chats here tonight. Did you hear me talking about Jean Lou down in Ensenada that has the El Rey I don't listen hotel? To you. I know you don't listen. To <laughs> Can you believe that his restaurant is the oldest restaurant, the oldest French restaurant, restaurant in, the in the Republic of Mexico? Does that make you just said that about five I know, but ago. I'm st just like, I oh. would think of being Mexico City you would or think something. think so, yeah, yeah. Yeah, right? He's I mean, lying. the French had control. No, he's not. I'm trying to impress he's you. He's a very nice man. Don't even start. John Lou, if you're listening, this is un pendejo. You're, you're so <laughs> intimidating. <laughs> you got all these guys lying to you to impress you. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody wants to impress me. <laughs> all right, Halibut Man says, I caught a 31 inch halibut in Long Beach Harbor today. Did you know that? What did he catch it on? I don't know. Yeah, what'd you catch it on, Mitchell? Give us that. You know, Dan keeps it a big secret all the time. Hey, we, good job, buddy. That is freaking awesome. That was a beautiful catch. I'll be posting that the on same, the morning briefing tomorrow. The same halibut you talked about earlier. Yes, exactly. Okay. But right. I didn't see his comment. Ah. I was ahead of the story. You were, you as usual. Were. I try to be out in front of the news. You're in front, yeah. yeah I'm very impressive, yes. <laughs> Depressive. Uh, Jeff Yeomans, 540 Slinger Club. For everyone interested... And learning the essentials of yeah. speed jigging, Brian Wynn, who's one of our favorites. He has so many great podcasts on Freeman Adventures. We'll be giving seminars at the Bard Hall Show at 2 p.m. every day on the Accurate Stage. Man, who's, I mean, Brian is great. You put me together with Brian. Yeah, yeah, Brian's yeah. never forgiven you since that, actually. <laughs> he's still trying to get away from you. Yeah, he's trying, he's trying to get even <laughs> with you. Yeah, uh, that's, a, that's a good opportunity right there. You know, I mean, in the shop here, we always get questions about, you know, trolling stuff and, and rod building and things like that and, and how to throw a jig. But I, I would say lately, the last, you know, year and a half, two years, you know, this speed jigging is 
the number one topic, you know, as far as new new things, you know, and it, it's not going anywhere, you know, it doesn't seem like it at least. So definitely would be a good opportunity. And he he's put together a really good presentation. Yeah. So, you know, if you ever want to see it, you know, in person and be able to ask some questions and things like that, um, and even check out the tackle, you know, firsthand, he can really, 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 uh, you know, get you way, way, way down the road as far as your learning process. So I definitely would take, take the opportunity to go down and check him in. I think he's going to be there every single day. So four days in a row at, at two o'clock. So I'm, I'm sure those Saturday Sundays are probably going to be packed. Oh my God! Yeah, yeah you yeah. would think. All right, Jeff. Thanks for bringing. Oh, Jeff. By the way, you reminded me of something. Brian Wynn, last year around Chinese New Year's, which is the first of February, this invited me over, and his wife hot did pot. hot pot for me. Yeah. Oh my God! I'm dreaming about that. <laughs> the seminar, maybe maybe it's a tie. Yeah, but I yeah. need the hot pot for sure. <laughs> hey, thank you so much, Jeff. That's great stuff. Axel Ram 5510. Oh, wait a minute. I have to read this with some emotion. You ready? I'm ready. To my beautiful wife, Brittany. Brittany must be uh, watching the show. Brittany, thank you. To my beautiful wife, Brittany. Love you, and I'll be home soon, my love. I threw that in there to help you out, Axel, at the end. <laughs> Meal more. All right, good stuff. Travis Bright. Travis, have you uh, talked your wife into that five-day trip yet? You got to work on that, man. You can do it. Well, we got a two-and-a-half-day trip on the Apollo in June. You're going to love that trip. You can make that one. Slam, for slow pitch jigging, what pound test would you use on a Saltus 35 heavy, 30 or 40 pound? Thank you, Travis. Good to see you, buddy. You know that size reel. I'd probably, you know, I used to say 40 pound was kind of the limit. Um, if you're going to be fishing rockfish, I'd probably go with the 30 pound. Now that reel is going to hold a ton, so you you can probably even like backfill it with something heavier. Um, but uh, but you know you're pretty close either way, I guess you know. But definitely, if it's going to be more of a rockfish reel, um, I definitely would go with that 30 pound. 40 pound would be something that if I thought I was going to do a little more yellowtail fishing, typically with a yellowtail you're not fishing as deep as you are with rockfish, so you don't really need that thin line to cut through the water. Whereas a rockfish, you know, I mean, nowadays, I mean, 800 feet is like not out of the question. So you might want that 30 pound for that. But so it really kind of depends on what you're going to be doing with it. All right. Very good, Travis. We'll see you on some trips this year. Always good to see you. Joel Lopez, question for Sam. What kind of fishing in SoCal would you make you call, would make you call in, uh, uh, call in sick, I guess, right? To get mm -hmm. a day on the water. 30 pound yellows, full speed biting iron, wahoo foamers. What would it be, Sam? Well, Wahoo Any of those things, be, right? Yeah, oh, well, Wahoo That Farmer. would be like, you Locally? Know, yeah, yeah, I'd be all over that. That'd be like, you know, uh, historic, really. But definitely full, spidey, full, full speed biting yellowtail. I, I, if, if it meant I could get them in one day, you know, that morning they called like me. Like that bite we had when I was yeah. in China? Yeah, yeah. I guess I have to go, go back to China. Yeah, yeah. As soon as you go back to China, I'm, I'm taking the day off. My co-teacher said, I'm going to be in Hong Kong this, uh, when is it? August, she goes, you should come over come and see down. my husband and daughter. I, I might have to go. It. You know what? I'm fishing. It'll go wide open. <laughs> yeah. That yellowtail would be hard, hard to resist, though, for sure. Jeremy Fontenot, and he's a super great guy. Met him in San Diego. Good evening, Phil and Sam. Happy New Year. Did you talk to any more bird experts today? Have you heard that whole thing? No. So this, I thought it was an osprey, but what do I know? I don't oh, know anything yeah, about yeah, birds. Yeah. Okay, and it killed a duck. Yeah, yeah. Flew off with a duck. And I thought the big thing was, hey, Bird. You know, you're trying to get comments, yeah, yeah, yeah. get people to participate. What what did it kill? And, you know, it was obviously a duck. So that was a dumb question I came up with. <laughs> the, I guess the more important question is, what the hell is it? Because, a predator. Yeah, it's a, a raptor, right? Uh. People are saying it's an osprey. No, it's a red-tailed hawk. Somebody said, I think it was uh, a guy, Tyler. And I go, well, don't red-tailed hawks have red tails? You know, that clearly doesn't have a red tail. Uh, Cooper's hawk. Wow. Um, so it's just like, I don't know. Do these things like... Do ospreys mate with red-tailed hogs? And <laughs> do you know the answer? I have to that? no idea. You don't know your bird's sexual uh, <laughs> no. habit. You're 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 lacking at that. <laughs> yeah, I'm very very ignorant. disappointed. I'm very in you. ignorant. Yeah. you know who would know about that is Scott. <laughs> who he think, wouldn't know? About well, he said studies he would, the he sexual. Would say, he would give you an answer. Though. He's uh, he was studying the sexual proclivities <laughs> of caterpillars the other day when I called him. So I know he would know this. All right, I have no. Yeah, uh, and oh, and I think he has more questions, Sam. Going? Are you going to the San Diego Bart Hall show? What about PCS? Sam doesn't miss any of these yeah, shows. Yeah, I'm going to all the shows here, Jeremy. So uh, if you uh, are going to either of those shows, you'll see me there. And I'll be goofing around with Sam at Truth a lot of those Truth be told, places. though, you know, a lot of times when you come to the booth, if I'm super busy, it's hard to really get in, you know, words. So 
If you get there really, really early or maybe really, really late, usually I have a little bit of time. But if you're there in the middle of the day, to be honest with you, I don't want to, I don't want to like appear to be rude or something like that. But it, it, it can get pretty crazy. I'm, I'm sure you remember. You oh, how rude there. you were? Yes, yeah, I do how rude remember I was, that. Yeah. yeah, what an a-hole, man. <laughs> really? Yeah, when you I had that guy from Toit, uh, yeah. whatever, and I remember he came up to you and said, Sam, would you like to you get away? I'm yeah. making a sale there. <laughs> I was, pass him on. Talk to this other guy here, man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He'll keep you busy for a while. <laughs> <laughs> no, it gets freaking crazy. Actually, yeah. when I look at you, I've never seen you rude. Of course, I'm kidding about that. But I do see when I had my booth all those years, and I'll probably be back next year maybe doing it, you get brain dead. And it's like somebody's talking to you and you're not even hearing what they're saying yeah. because you're just shot like at some point. You know what I mean? Yeah. So. I mean, you know, part of it too is you're processing so much information. Yeah. You know, what's going on, what happened, you know, and maybe a guy was looking for something. You start thinking, okay, what do I got to do to get something for that guy? Or Those kids are shoplifting over there. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah. You, you yeah. Got all kinds yeah of your stuff eyeballs there. are going everywhere. Like yeah. you're trying to watch everything. So it, it does make it tough. I can't really just go there and relax. You know, I mean, I want you guys to go and relax and have a good time. But but I, I may not be able to join you in that quite quite uh, as easily unless you're there early or late. Typically, if you're there really early, uh, and especially really late, you get into like the last hour or so. Usually, you come back by the booth and and and, and it slowed down some. So uh, so if you want to come down and visit, you know, try to plan it that way if it works out. Christopher Navarro sends twenty bucks. Ooh, Chris, we're in. Sam, Chris, thank you so very much. Phil, what does your crystal ball predict? For this year's Yellowtail action. Oh, man. It was non-existent last year. You want to look at the crystal ball? You see anything? Well, whatever you say, it's What do you opposite. see up there besides dirt? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, Chris, I'm going to make this statement now, and I hope you all pay attention. Um, I love, uh, so we have this kind of El Nino thing going on, but our water is not that warm. It's mm -hmm. kind of warm. But we're seeing some odd stuff go on, you know? And... We've already seen some really good yellowtail action at San Quentin. Yeah. Um, the Royal Polaris on that five-day trip. Now, they were down there about 150 miles yeah. fishing that bluefin. But he went into the coast somewhere. I'm not sure where. Mm -hmm. And he had really good yellowtail action. So we've already seen that, Chris, so far here. I think it's going to be a good yellow year. Man, we have the magnet here, that's for sure. There is so much market squid yeah. in our local waters that all those predators can get in here. I think the one thing, and Sam has mentioned it before, and I will mention it again, is that some of those yellows, like out on Cortez Bank, and they never used to get the pressure they get now because yeah. everybody's fishing bluefin. And so you've got all those long-range guys up there doing and they're all hammering that yellowtail. But, you know, if uh, the good Lord sends enough yellows our way, it'll hold up under that, yeah. and it'll be a great year. And I'd love to see a local bite. That's what yeah. I'd really like to see. Even I think it's going to be good, Chris. What do you think? Yeah, I mean... We're definitely due, you know, I mean, I, I, what we had three years ago to about maybe 10 years ago, we had kind of a period here where the yellowtail fishing was just crazy. You know, how we talk about the sea bass now and the halibut, yeah. the yellowtail was like that, you know, I mean, you know, the three quarter day boats were going out and catching 30, 40 a day the whole summer, you know, at Catalina. And so, you know, I'm not sure if we'll get a return of that, but I'm not, I'm not sure anymore. You know, I mean, it seems like every year we get some kind of crazy new situation here i mean you know with the sea bass is kind of the current thing you know that the 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 sand bass is finally coming back you know now we're seeing them here even in the winter time yeah so i think would, that's, a, that's a good a sign yeah that's a different kind of thing you yeah. know so does that mean we're going to catch yellowtail i don't know i just know that it seems like every year there's something else there's something else that's kind of like wow this is exciting again you know yeah. we're catching this or we're catching that so you know i i, I sure hope so because i love catching yellowtail but Hey, Chris, yeah, we definitely do. He may not know, but I know. They're coming. Good yellow tail <laughs> year this year. Labworks. I use one of them uh, for all my micro jigs. You remember what that's no. a reference to? You Labworks, made... we may have, uh, it might have been a reference to a previous thing, and Sam and I are brain dead, so. Yeah, sorry. All right, Jamie Fernandez Jr., better late than never. Happy Monday. For a three day trip, would you go with late May or middle of November for tuna? I would personally go on the Independence five-day trip with Friedman Adventures, <laughs> departing April 4th and returning April 9th. It's going to be a great trip. No, uh, go ahead, Sam. Sorry. You know, uh, that you're, you're kind of on the two ends of where it's a transition time. You know, you're, you're just as good either way. I, I would venture to say that your earlier trip is probably going to be easier to get on, you know, as far as openings. Usually the season hasn't been going. That later trip in November... 
is probably going to be coming off of the basically the highlight of the season, you know, the 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 time when it, the fishing is the best. And so you might see a lot of guys that are kind of still booking trips and hard to get on and that type of thing. But but as far as it being successful, that's uh, a hard one, man. You, you're kind of at the very end of the trip. If you can go in the middle of the year, more like August, September, you're probably a lot better off. But um, even one month later, you know, in, in, in June, you might be pretty good, you know. I mean, kind of where it starts to get a little more consistent. Scott Buchert sent us the $25 earlier, and now he's promoting your competition. <laughs> what a jerk, you know. Uh, new Bass Pro in Irvine coming. Thanks, cool. Scott. Sam really appreciates that. Yeah, you know, I've heard about that. I mean, a lot of guys may look at that as kind of a negative, you know, but Bass Pro is not, not going to carry, you know, it, it, there's two different stores. It is. You know, they're, they're really more of a clothing store, you know, not really the kind of place that's going to be able to provide you good service, that type of thing, but it's You're going to get cool. me in trouble with Bass Pro now. No, but they're cool. I mean, it's a place yeah. I would go to get maybe some well, more Bass stuff or yeah. maybe some clothing or things like that, you know, or whatever. I mean. I think so Scott gets his zipper wax there. That's where he gets it. Yeah, yeah. They, right. I bet you they have Do it Do you there. carry that? I don't. Yeah, but, see? But I bet you they have it there, yeah. yeah. There you go. All right. Uh, let's see. Lab Works. Or no, Steve Bermudez. Sizzle Pop Boom. Dial 911. Happy New Year. That's, that's to you. I don't know. I, I, I don't know. How's that thing go now when you have a drink? It's uh, por arriba, por abajo, por el centro, por el dentro. <laughs> mm. I remember that from my drinking days. You're not impressed, are you? What? Oh, yeah, I'm, okay. I'm, oh. <laughs> Daiwa bags are what I use. The stitching seems to be better, says Labworks. Okay. No comment on that? Yeah, I mean, it might be. Daiwa bags are pretty good, too, you know. They just... The one, the one thing I will say is I don't know if they have the, quite the variety, but they, they make a backpack. They also make this other drop-in style. that They don't make a roller bag, I don't think. But So, yeah, they have a couple of different ones. In fact, uh, you know, they, they do have a nice backpack, but we're out of that one, too. They're You're good. out of everything, man. That's, That's a, a good, good thing. Stuff. Well, we're kind of in this in-between time where we're not really keeping as good a stock because we're getting ready for the show, so a lot of things are going to come right before the show. So if we, if we run out of it this time of year, you, we're, we won't have it again until – right before the show. Thanks, everybody, for joining us. Tons of comments. You can forget the game. I'll tell you that right now. <laughs> it's great to be with you all. Thanks for hitting that like button. Share this video right now. You can send it to a friend. And don't forget morning briefing tomorrow morning at the crack of dawn. I'll be out there again. All right, Jaime Fernandez Jr., what eight-foot rod do you recommend for a Pen Fathom 25 NLD2 backed up with 65 pound braid, top shot of 30 to 40 pound floral? So, any of those rods that are rated like 30 to 60, you know, so whether it be a United Composites, Cal Star Seeker, you know, any of those rods um, rated 30 to 60. So, yeah, that's kind of where I'd look at. All right. Um, Tim Marquez. You weren't here either when I mentioned Tim Marquez, but Tim brought down tons of stuff yesterday nice. for Mexico. Tons, good, tons. Good tons. dude, man. A fantastic guy. He wants you to know if you could show him the Wahoo jigs that worked last year. Sure. All right, perfect. Um, and I'll, uh, what will I do? Oh, I can do an advertisement. You can. Yeah. How about efficient air conditioning and heating? Or heating and air conditioning. John Lopez is one heck of a great guy with a wonderful family. If you need any heating or air conditioning needs, there's nobody else to go to other than John Lopez and efficient air conditioning and heating. I might have that backwards. Um, by the way, everybody, morning briefing tomorrow morning. There's been a lot to talk about this winter. We have some really inclement weather heading our way Thursday, so be careful about that. It's going to be another windy day, no question about it. Sam and I will be over at SoCal Wings around 745 i would say maybe eight like it, yeah <laughs> something like that and starting to push up to almost 100 people watching right now very wow. good we thank you so much take it away sam so tim you know there wasn't really anything super you know stand out as far as you know one size one color one kind of jig but you got your your uh, different kinds of jigs here you have your two categories really it's going to be your bombs so this is the catchy tackle bomb here which comes already rigged with wire and everything that and then you have more like your Jim, jimmy bomb style and this is actually from jri this guy here if i can get it out of the package so this guy here has no rigging and one of the one of the advantages to this guy is that you can rig it however you want so 
normally you would think Wahoo, you want to put wire on it, and you can do that. But one of the, one of the other ways that that also works sometimes is putting heavy fluoro, 150 pound to 200 pound fluoro. You'll put on this guy here, and sometimes that'll kind of get you some more bites. Really, and it'll get you some more bite offs as well. You know, um, but there are times where you'll get more bites, so you go through some more jigs. But but that's that's this other style of jig there. So, but it's also going to be in the category category of a Wahoo bomb. That's a catcher, or that one is from JRI. Oh, okay. Yeah. Then your other style here is going to be your just your regular casting jigs here. Here's a C striker jigs from Catchy Tackle. Typically, that that gold is probably still the best one here. Taddy actually has a nice one here. It's a um, it's a Y two with a kind of a, a Wahoo hook on there. And then there's a Raider jig. Now the Raider jigs, um, he didn't make them last year and I think he's not making them this year. So these are gonna be kind of hard to come by. Very good jigs have been around for a long time. And once again, you'll rig these kind of however you want. You can rig them with wire or with the heavy fluoro. Um, the other jig too, actually, oh, I forgot to get, is one from Salas. They, they, they kind of, it's kind of been a uh, uh, under the radar style jig. But I think, you know what? We sold out of them here. We had a few customers that came through um, about a month ago, and they love them. They bought every single one. I had. Oh wow! Yeah, they cleaned me out. So that reminds me. Yeah, they they make a. That reminds you to order some more. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, it's a six X Junior and a six X that they make in a couple of different Wahoo colors, and they'll have a Wahoo hook on them. So you can check those out as well. Tim, there you have it, my friend. Good to see you yesterday, also. Tim actually, he, he walked in and he goes, you know, I got all this stuff and I was going, oh, do you have time to sit down and chat for a second? And, you know, I've, I've got a busy day. I go, okay, well, we'll go out to the truck. And so we get all the stuff unloaded and he comes in and then a couple of people come in. They were very interesting people talking about cancer cures and using leopard sharks and people that I know that do hmm. the, I think Tim was there for like an hour and a half. <laughs> I go, whatever, whoever you, was waiting for you was going to kill you. Yeah. I know, man, this was way too interesting. <laughs> so that was great, Tim. Joel Lopez, what are both of your guys' top three memorable fishing trips? Wow, top three, huh? Yeah, that's, I know, it's, it's hard, right? Tall order. Number one for me would be my son, Philip, being born April the 9th yeah, while yeah. I was out fishing. So that's a great memory for him. I prioritized white sea bass over my son being born. Yes, that's a rotten <laughs> thing. Uh, number two uh, would be uh, Bluefin Tuna Bite with Joe Chain on the Conquest, probably in, I want to say, 87, something like that. So you didn't have, you didn't catch bluefin that mm -hmm. often. And we got into a bite on, I want to say, 40 to 60 pound fish and put the wood to them. Yeah, yeah. Really nailed them. And, uh, you know, I've got them. I probably, uh, I have to admit, driving with my boys to Palmas de Cortez and just like, boys, Man, when we drive over and you come and you see, right when we're coming into Santa Rosa, you see the Sea of Cortez. It is freaking magical. And it was. And then that first day, we had almost double digits on the Marlin. We Then, you know, my kids are like, hey, can we catch something else? Like, you little brats, you know? <laughs> so we went and caught roosterfish and yellowfin. It was amazing. So if I thought about it, I'd probably come up with some more. But those are my three. Sam, can you top that? No, I probably can. But, I mean, off the top of my head, I mean... Gosh, there's so many, like you said. I mean, I would say that my first surface iron yellowtail on Toronado, um, probably like 30 years ago. I would say my next one is probably, I don't know, my first tuna, you know, uh, offshore is probably like like 25 years ago or something like that. Um, I was on the boat called a Sunrise, small little gut boat, probably like 40. Sunrise, I don't even yeah. remember that. Yeah, we, we, you remember uh, who ran it? I don't know. Where um, was it out of? It was out of Point Loma. Uh -huh. and, um, Sunrise. It was one of those things where they just picked up a 10-pack boat to, to take on some overflow. Oh, okay. Yeah, we had called, and it'd been, they, everybody had been booked. It was like in November, I thought. And everybody was booked, booked, booked. And we called, and like, oh, we just got another boat online if you want to go. And so we booked the trip, went down there. It was like a nice 25-pound yellowfin. That was, that was pretty cool. And then maybe this a couple of years ago here, I got that big yellowfin. I think it was be my the next one. But after Heck, that. Heck, you just had a 50-pound yellowtail 50 on the 50-pound yellowtail. Yeah, that was kind of cool, too. You yeah. know what I mean? And, and then fishing with the kids too, you know, taking you know taking Diego and Luna fishing. I mean, they can't can't pass up on the list there. That, that's very very high. So I don't know if you wanted anything more exciting than that, but that's that's about it for me. Thank you, Joel. Great question. El Presidente is with us. Chuck Zimmer. Zimmer, the president of the Redondo Beach Rod and Gun Club. I was calling it the Rod and Reel Club and everything else <laughs> on a video I did. So I get screwed up sometimes. Chuck, good to see you. By the way, you've got to be at La Fogata 
on the 21st of January. Don't come up with some phony excuse like this guy. Uh, because you made that Christmas party a reality by uh, allowing us to hold it there at the Redondo Beach Rod and Gun Club. Does SKB make a wheel kit for their boxes or another company aftermarket? No, not that I know of. Um, to, to be honest with you, I think most of that market that, that, that uses that box is going to be doing long-range fishing. And typically, you're going to just grab a, a dock cart you know, to unload your gear from your truck. So there's really not a whole lot of need for, for a wheel uh, kit for that. But you know, I have seen some stuff. I mean, at the, the feet on the bottom of the box, they're actually screwed in. And, and they're basically like furniture feet. And so I, I would imagine if you can... You can probably screw it right into that thing with some small casters, but not, nothing that I've seen anybody do as a kit that you can buy. All right, Chuck said he called SKB, and they sent him new shoulder straps yeah. and side pockets for free. He raves about the company. He says, great company. Yeah. yeah, they're great. Yeah, they really are. Joel Lopez, in a party boat of 15-plus passengers, how can you have an edge and get bit more? And obviously you can because the boys always catch more fish. Mm -hmm. Right? So what would you say? Wow. Is it technique? Is it tackle? Is it knowledge? It's all that or is stuff. it all of it? It's all of yeah, it, yeah. It is, yeah. Right? I mean stay time on the water. The I would say the 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 only thing that you can do of an immediate kind of advantage, not something that's gonna take you years and years, is is get friendly with the crew. Yeah. You know, I mean that's probably the only thing that you can really do to change your luck at, at a moment's notice. You know, um, if you've already, uh, if you already knew how to do it, you'd be doing it, you know, so it isn't like a matter of you picking a live bait versus a dead bait, that type of thing. You know, you already, as you get, as you do more and more fishing, you're going to learn how to pick a better bait, how to hook it better, how to cast it, how, how to fish it even. And that just takes time, time on the water. Uh, one of the things that I remember telling a customer the other day is, uh, you know, he's going to be doing a long range trip first time this year as well, this, this coming year or not, well now this year is, um, you know, to try to go on as many like three quarter day trips as possible. And he said, well, why three quarter day trips? Because typically you're going to be doing a lot of live bait fishing. You'll have some time. And I told him, I said, if you can, even if it doesn't produce you any results on that day is try to fish 15 baits in an hour. You know, you're fishing a bait for, you know, three or four minutes the most. And you're just going through baits, going through baits, going through baits. The repetition is what's going to really couldn't agree more. Give you give you that experience, and that it's so hard because when you go fishing, whether it's on a three quarter day trip or a five day trip, you're trying to make the most of it. So you're not trying to look at it as a learning experience. You're just trying to go as a catching experience. But if you're trying to prep for that five day and the skills that you're going to need is is you're just going to need to fish more baits more more often. And so the more you do that, the better. So you might take that approach of just trying to fish a lot of baits you know through the day and, and fishing and casting see you know, see, you know trying to improve your casting distance and we know that sometimes you know guys that cast real hard or don't cast real well they'll injure their bait and maybe not have good bait presentation but that's part of your learning is trying to cast a bait and have it fall in the water a little softer and not kind of like you know go make that thing go 100 miles an hour so you know doing that as best as you can is is, is go fishing as often as you can and, and fish a lot of baits. You know, don't be afraid to go through baits over and over and over and spend time at the tank trying to pick the best bait. And you're going to find that even on that three-quarter day boat, you're going to end up hooking more fish and you're going to have more success the more you go. Sage advice. I couldn't agree more. It's that repetition, repetition of choosing a hot bait, making that cast, right? Yeah. Because sometimes, like, you're, if you're on an offshore trip, you pick three or four baits on a given trip. Yeah. But on a three-quarter day trip, like you yeah. said, man, it's all day long. You're yeah. working at it. Just go and perfecting go. Perfecting the whole thing. Even yeah. your reel. You even make sure your reel is like you wound it in straight. Like after you fish a bait, you know, you're going to see that if you didn't if you didn't wind it in straight and the next bait you get is going to be the best bait of the day, you go to cast it, you get a small little backlash, your bait goes flying off, and there went your opportunity. So, you know, all these little details that are going to get you in the right position is something that the more repetition that you do, the, the better you're going to get at it. Yeah, and I mean, it can be, I can remember like fishing, I don't even remember the twilight boat it was, but out of Redondo, I would go and just cream everybody every trip mm -hmm. because I was fishing 12-pound test and yeah. everybody was fishing 25 and it was calico bass fishing. Mm -hmm. And it was, yeah. and people are like, hey, what, you know, and I'm fishing light line. Yeah, that's what I was telling Brian today. Mm -hmm. He said, growing up, you know, first, you know, overnight trips that I would do, I, I, I would take a little millionaire and a, and a small uh, Cal Star 195 that I that I wrapped myself, and I was fishing 10 pound every day, you know, every day that I go fishing, 
And um, same thing, uh, just one after another on the calicles. And yeah, you, you get burned once in a while. You hook a yeah. sea bass or a yellow, yeah. and you couldn't stop it, whatever. But if I was fishing 20 pound, I would have never hooked that fish anyway. You know, but in, in turn, I hooked, you know, 100 bass and 40, 40 bonita all day long, ha- having the time of my life, you know. So that, to me, that's the reason I was going. And, and I think that repetition is what really got me going. Back then, that was in the days of anchovies. So you were fishing a small reel just to get it, just to get a bait out. Yeah. But it's repetition. That's the number one thing. Martin M. or Martin M. Happy New Year, guys. Happy New Year, Martin. Uh, what's your thoughts about using straight braid to wire leader when throwing surface irons? I think it'll be great kelp cutter. Does wire help certain jigs swim better? I know there's a school of thought that thinks it, that they do. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's definitely one of those things that that guys do. As far as it being a kelp cutter, you know, the, the problem with uh, with that is that that's only going to work when you hook a fish. You know, a lot of times with kelp, you end up hooking the kelp with your jig, so that's not going to help you there. But, um, but yeah, I mean, it, it could be something that could help. I mean, I, I personally still fish straight mono. I, I feel like I can cast it better. Um, so for me, hooking a fish is still the most important thing. And yeah, sometimes it means you're going to lose a couple jigs, but that's why I have a thousand jigs. It's You're never going to go through them all. So to me, it's easier to buy more jigs and to hook more fish than it is to trying to save that one fish, that one jig, you know, and and uh, that's kind of the way I approach that as far as that. But but yeah, you're right. That that wire is something that I, that I'm not sure if there's any kind of definite proof that's going to catch you more fish, but I know it definitely won't hurt you, you know. And so that may, might be something you might try. Steve Bermuda, Sam, do you carry breakaway tackle rods, terminal tackle? I don't. I don't. I think that's an online brand or maybe East Coast brand, but. No, I don't. I think they make like surf rods and stuff like that. I'm not really sure. Hey, you have made a comment tonight about me getting the microphones right from the very beginning. It's only when I screw up that you Correct disparage me. me in front of yeah. people. But when I do things right, you give me no credit. Well, I'm trying to get to this to this game. If I started doing yeah. that, we'd never get anywhere. I know, really. <laughs> All right, yeah. Let me let me speed this up a little bit. Mackie, <laughs> Sam, have you fished the Squid X, Squid Trex, Squid Trex, or the Daiwa Rock Hopper? Are there any more? unconventional jigs on your list to fish this year. There used to be a guy, Rock Hopper Lures. You remember that guy? Yeah. You remember Rock Hopper Lures? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Gene or something. Yeah. It was a nice guy, as I remember. I can't remember. Anyway, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> Sorry about that. I digress. Yeah. So, yeah, I've fished both of those. I've caught, I've caught rockfish and bass on, on, on the squid treks and on that Rock Hopper. Uh, <laughs> definitely caught lots of rockfish on that. But nothing new, nothing that I could think of. Off the top of my head, that's different for this year, but I'm sure something will come around. <laughs> Man, you people have obviously missed the show. We have at least another 20 great um, comments to go. Hey, so yeah. uh, I'm catching up. I was doing something else, Sam. Joe Lopez. Joe Lopez. On a day that you are just not getting bit and you're doing everything right, that's called snake bit, right, Joe? Yeah. I know exactly what you're talking about. You usually do. Uh, how can you get off that mental hurdle on the day you get fit, get to fish? Man, that, that is an age-old question. Yeah, Have yeah, you ever been, yeah. You've been snake bit, right? Yeah, it happens. It's not your day. Oh, so, my God. Yeah, yeah. It's so frustrating. Yeah. I mean, you know, fishing is just like that. I mean, I, I don't really <clears throat> try to – you try not to focus on the one thing. I think that's one of the things, too. It's maybe everybody's different, and not everybody can do that. You know, sometimes – we get fixated on on something, and all of a sudden, we can't shake it for four or five trips, and we just say, "Oh, screw this! I don't want to fish anymore." Yeah. But but generally, I think that you have to kind of take every every bait as a new opportunity. One of the things that I've kind of learned, maybe just jig fishing in general, that's kind of kind of just cemented in my mind is, whenever I'm fishing, even 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 sometimes in the harbor, you know, you're fishing, and and you're just trying to see how a fish a jig swims or something like that, or showing <laughs> someone how to cast. I almost always feel like Every single cast, something can happen, you know? Yeah, right. I don't know why, you know, but there's definitely some positivity. It's a mental thing. Yeah, I agree. And and I, I think that the more you do it, the more time you do it, the more times you have success, the more you'll forget about the times you don't. And it seems like when you look back, you just remember the successes and there's just so much of them that it, it just kind of <clears throat> erases all of the times that you didn't catch fish. So to me, I think the more you do it, the more it's going to be easier to do that. In the beginning, it is tough because I think you just kind of, you know, you focus and fixate on, on the negative and what am I doing wrong and that kind of stuff. But maybe what you can do is, like I was saying earlier, is focus on 
one small thing, you know, like maybe on that day, if you just kind of, it's not working out is for the next hour, what I'm going to do is I'm going to fish 15 baits or 20 baits, you know, and that's going to be my focus. Not necessarily trying to, you know, this guy just hooked a fish, man, how come I'm not hooking any fish? Just fish a bait, fish a bait, just fish a bait. And you almost want to time yourself, you know, every three minutes or so, I'm going to fish a new bait and fish a new bait and fish a new bait to the point to where now you're going to be focusing on something else. And maybe by the time that that hour goes through, you'll hook a fish and you'll kind of go to go away. But, you know, you just, the more you do it, the easier it gets. I know. But Joel, yeah, we've both been there. Yeah. And man, it's frustrating. Balboa Fish Group. I always go to Wiley's. Yeah, I love Wiley. Um, uh, he says, have you met her turtle? This is a family show, Balboa Fish. No, of course <laughs> I haven't. Uh, I'm only kidding. Uh, the old lady there is so sweet. The old lady's name is Jenny. And she is sweet. She's mm. a very nice person. I used to do um, updates with her all the time. She's a very, very lovely person. Bob Wiley has passed away, the guy that used to be there years ago. But uh, I think, I don't know what's up with that place now. I'll, I'll have to go. I went by there. God, I can't remember if it was before I went to China or when I came back. But I just went back to renew that friendship. Mm -hmm. And same old place with that big Fred Oakley uh, four-pounder up there. So, yeah, uh, great place for sure. Halibut Man. He caught that 31-inch halibut. Here we go. Now we're getting to the crux of this. On a three-quarter jig head with a three-and-a-half bass scampi. All right. There you are. Cool. Scampi, man. Old school. Yeah. <laughs> halibut man. I'll tell you what, I wouldn't go up against that guy. He's, he catches fish all the time. It's right in his name. I know. <laughs> Sean Sarkeesan caught a rare 3.17-pound goldfish. At Lake Balboa the other day, I'll send you a pic, Phil. I want to see that thing, man. A three-pound goldfish? Pound goldfish? <laughs> How did it taste? Was it yeah. good? Yeah. <laughs> you get a taco out of it. Yeah, really. Is that what we're having uh, February 21st? It <laughs> could be. La Fogata? Uh, Joel Lopez, what are a couple of fishing stories you remember where fish were finicky and you figured out a specific way to catch the fish and it was satisfying? Wow. That's a tough one, too, mm. man. I don't know. <laughs> I can tell you where they were finicky, and I didn't figure it out. Yeah, yeah. I can tell you that I went with Dave Dodge to a local lake. I think it was Miles Square Park. And I was you know, I was there to screw around with him. I haven't seen him for a long time. And I just basically throw my bait out. I watched him, man, and he just freaking, he just scientifically fished this part of the lake, fished this part of the lake, made a longer cast, made a long, I've told this story before. Anyway, he's just freaking wide open. Little Mexican family next to us. They don't have a clue. They're almost, they, they weren't worse than me. But they were on an even. <laughs> and then all of a sudden, he's got the kids. He's handing the kids. They're having a, a blast and a ball. It was really cool, man. It was fun. But I kind of sometimes get a little lazy and I'm just there to decompress. And, you know, but my, my really competitive days were when I was a little bit younger. Now I'm like, I want to get some video. But did you ever figure it out when you were having trouble? You just kind of keep going. I don't know if the day's long enough for me to run out of juice, you know. I mean, I, th I think you just kind of keep trying different keep stuff. trying different stuff. Yeah, I mean, that's the thing, you know. I mean, that's probably the other part of it, too, of going a lot, is that eventually you just kind of, like, develop new tools and, and new methods and, and different things like that and watch different guys see the way they do it. And that's why you end up with the 100-pound tackle boxes that, you know, you have so many different ways of doing something. But, but yeah, don't be afraid to try something new, and, and, and eventually you'll kind of, just figure it out, but it's just, I don't know if I remember one specific way. I think you just, every every single time I go, I approach it with an open mind and 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 think that, that whatever is in my mind is the way it's going to work. I, I, I have put very little weight in that, you know. I trust it to a degree, but at the same time, I'm, I'm always open to the idea that I'm going to see what else is going on. If yeah. someone's doing something different, then you go and make it work, so. Good stuff. Kim Herbert, he is the gentleman that came from, remember? Yeah. Yeah, where yeah, did yeah. he come from? Florida, or he was uh, out here for a wedding? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think from like Montana. Or yeah, something. I think so. Montana. Yeah, or or uh, he's gonna tell us here in a second. Mm -hmm. But this is great news. He says, "Happy New Year, my daughter and I will be on oh, your wow. five day trip." I love it. That's gonna be a great trip, even though Sam's not gonna be there. Is there an advantage, Kim? Thank you for uh, joining us on that trip to match braid and mono, thirty pound braid to thirty pound mono. See you in April as we travel from Missouri. Missouri. And not only Kim came here, he came to the studio and I yeah. wasn't there, but he left me a lovely note. So really looking forward to fishing with you and your daughter. Sam? Um, you know, the only advantage I would say is possibly if your 30 pound braid is thinner than the mono might, might let your bait swim a little bit better. But just be advised that, you know, in my kind of, you know, 
limited experience. I think typically we'll go a little heavier on the braid. So like if you're going to be using 30 pound leader, typically we'll fish like 50 pound braid. Reason being is that typically your mono or your leader has a higher breaking strength. And then also too, the braid isn't as, um, uh, doesn't have as much line abrasion resistance as your, as your leader does as well. So if you get into a tangle or rub on the boat, a little bit more chance that you might break it off. But one of the things that I have seen guys do the last couple of years is step down their braid. And so, you know, that might be one of those things that Joel was just asking about. It may be a little bit of a, of a, of a trick. You might have a, you know, your sleeve to get a bite when the, the bite's a little picky. So that's, that'd be the, that'd be the advantage. Maybe getting a bite. Patrick Harnjack says, thank you so much for showing the bags. He super appreciates it. Joel Lopez, do polarized sunglasses actually help when fishing? If they do, what are your recommendations for our fishery? I know they help in the surf. For sure. You know, I mean, uh, as far as recommendations, we, we sell the Costa sunglasses here. I've, I've tried them all, and to me, the Costa um, uh, lenses are, are probably the just, just the easiest on my eyes, you know. As far as it being something that's required, I don't know about that. You know, I mean, that's not something that's going to make you catch more fish specifically. I think for me, doing a lot of lure fishing, jig fishing, there are times where you're just able to see something in the water a little bit better than if I didn't have the sunglasses on. But my overall kind of reason is, you know, about 10 years ago, maybe 11 years ago, I, uh, shit, man, probably like 20 years ago now, um, you know, I used to always have sunglasses on me, but they'd always be the cheaper ones. It's something you'd buy a big five or something like that, closed out type thing. And the first time I used a high quality pair, the first thing I noticed wasn't so much that I could see through the water better, but more that my eyes weren't as tired at the end of the day. You know, to me, that was the biggest deal is I was able to fish every day to the end of the day and my eyes weren't tired. My head didn't hurt, you know, and, and if we got into like an evening bite or a night bite, I, I was fresh just like I was in the morning. So to me, that was the biggest thing is protecting your eyes and your eyes do get fatigued. You know, you're out in the water. Like oh, yeah. That. And if you have good, good sunglasses, you're just going to be fresher at the end of the day, especially nowadays we have all that night fishing. Patrick Harnjack says, speaking of old restaurants, a small town called Butte, Montana is the oldest continuous open Chinese restaurant in the United States. That's crazy. Go figure. Oldest wow. Chinese restaurant in America is in Montana. Reminds me of Mexicali, Mexico. Yeah. They have tons of Chinese well, restaurants. Well, maybe there. it's not the first, uh, we were talking about the, uh, the French restaurant. Yeah. Maybe it's not the first. It may be just the oldest. No, it is the oldest. It's not the first. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's the oldest. Okay. Right. So yeah, yeah, yeah. That, I mean, yeah. Hey, yeah, John Lou is a very nice John Lou Bitteran. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. a great guy. And uh, he said he said it's the first one. No, 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 no. The, the oldest. Old, that's what I mean. Yeah. So maybe there's been there was something yeah, before that in Mexico City and they went out of business. Yes. Yeah. Right. So, yeah. It had to be Mexico City yeah, is where the first think. ones yeah, were. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. But they went out of business. Or well, because once they kicked the French out of there, mm -hmm. I, I doubt they were real thrilled about right. having French restaurants around. <laughs> Get out of here! Don't come back. Um, all right, uh, Labwork says, damn it, hot pots again. <laughs> Scott Buchert is on his hands and knees saying, please sign up for the five-day trip April 4th through the 9th. And I concur, Scott, you're right. Jeremy says, Vietnamese hot pots are great. We did one with Mako not that long ago. Joel Lopez, between the both of you, lots of fishing hours, what are your top five things learned, must know secrets or advice? It's a secret. I can't tell them. Yeah. Sorry, Joel. <laughs> yeah, exactly. No, I don't think there is any secrets, man. The guys that do it, they just do it a lot. Yeah. I mean, uh, if, if you're asking, what do we recommend? Uh, I think Sam and I are both make friends with a crew member. Mm -hmm. Do your research. You know, figure out what's going on. And, you know, like Sam said, you're going on that eight-day trip. Uh, go down. Talk to yeah. Mark and Paul at the Fred Hall Show. At the Independence booth, uh, find out what they say. So do your research, be yeah. prepared, have the right tackle. You got to do all that right, and then learn on the fly, right? Yeah. Don't yeah, go yeah. out there with blinders on, man. Just watch what's happening. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's going to be the biggest thing is making sure that you're open to 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 any type of new thing. You know, I mean, you know, make sure that you. I'm not sure where your look closest shop is, but you know, make sure you go to a shop that has uh, you know staff that does some long range fishing and and have them kind of like you know, hopefully answer those types of questions. You know, and those kind of questions are going to be something where I think it really depends on what kind of fishing you've done and what you can relate it to. So, you know, if you have time, you want to come down here. 
Uh, I can definitely, you know, spend some time with you there. <laughs> and a lot of it's really going to be more of a conversation thing rather than just a list of these are the five things you do to catch a lot of fish. I mean, that's not really, I know for the internet, that's what's going to get clicks, you know, on a, on a, on a YouTube video or something like that is do this and you will be famous yeah, and right. rich, you know? Right. But that's just not the way it works. You know, it, it really is a lot of practice. The other part of it too, like like Phil was saying, is get familiar with the crew. That's going to be your number one asset. I mean, if this is the first time going on a long range trip, your number one asset is going to be going on uh, and being familiar with the crew. And one of the things you might find out is when you, if you have the chance to go to the shows, is get to know them for the first time, and 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 uh, you'll you'll kind of be a little, at least a little more familiar with them when you get on the trip. Yeah, for sure. Hey, Sarah is up there in Montana. Sarah Hornjack, and she says, with those orcas hanging around La Jolla, do you think? They will have any effect on the bluefin tuna population since they're eating dolphin. No, I don't think so, right? Yeah, they're not they're, eating bluefin. Well, they, even if they do, I don't think there's that many. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, there's just like a pod, like yeah, you know, eight or was, ten of them. Or even something. if there was a hundred, they couldn't eat that many. Yeah, bluefin. geez, I know. There's a lot of bluefin out there. By the way, the, the Mexican commercial done. fleet is done. Oh, yeah. I mean, virtually done. They may be done now, probably, but they were close. It's it's probably some, weather permitting, I would think. Yeah, I bet. Think about that. They yeah. reached their quota in the first two weeks yeah. after the season opens. Yeah. Wow. Somebody well, told me, Bob Osborne told me, that's probably, I go, how much? How many fish is that? You know, And he kind of did some, he said about a half a million fish. I would say so, Are you so, kidding yeah. me, man? In two weeks? Yeah. Wow. I would say so. I yeah. mean, one of the things that happens and the reason it kind of happens so quickly is that that fish kind of stages up right in front of them. Those Ensenada fleets, you right? Know? And so they're so close. It isn't like they got to drive out, you know, to the Hurricane Bank or something like that. You right. Know? Those things are right out front. You know, as close as really they are all year long. Makes their life right at, easy. Right at that time of year. Yeah. So if their quota started in September or October, they'd have, probably have to drive a long way into U.S. waters or something yeah. like that. But it starts right at the time when that tuna is right in front of them. Slid back down that yeah. way, and it's right there. Stacked up and kind of bunched up. They don't again. need it to bite a bait either. No, no. no. <laughs> they're wrapping up with the weather to be good. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, amazing stuff. So, yeah, I don't think that's going to happen, sir. I think they're going to be okay. Hal wants to know, regarding red tails, only the male's tails are red. Hey, Hal, man. thank you. New info. The plot gets, uh, the plot thickens. <laughs> Christopher Navarro, I'm interested in the five-day independence trip. Sam, what gear do you think I should take on a trip like that? Include bait, jig, nighttime rigs, please. And everything you got there, Chris. Yeah, I because mean, think about it. Now, everything. I don't want to speak for the independents because I may be wrong, but I'm thinking to myself, bluefin tuna possibility, mm -hmm. sea bass a possibility, uh, yellows and you know all that stuff. rockfish, everything. rockfish, right? Because um, you probably can make squid, probably, um, and you know so you you might have some really good bluefin. Maybe they're not biting. Then you got you can easily run up to the Channel Islands if uh -huh. it's full speed up there on the sea bass like yeah, it's yeah. been. I think there's a lot of possibilities. What do you think? Yeah, for sure. I mean, you know, um, come on, the, Sam, sell the trip. If me. the yeah. answer is, you know, uh, what's the little that I, the least that I can get away with, that's a tough one. <laughs> Especially this being being this far away and be, there being so much tuna at 100 miles already, you know, I I, I just can't see a situation in which tuna is going to be out of the, out of the, you know, uh, off the menu. You know, so even if they have to go south for 150 miles, they're going to go fish tuna. I'm sure at some point. So. You know, you're going to need everything from 20 pound to 100 pound. You know, jig sticks, maybe even if they fish down off the coast there, there might be some nice, you know, yellowtail fishing off the coast. And your bait fishing, I mean, everything from 25 pound to 100 pound, you know, I mean, so it really is just about everything. I mean, that's kind of one of the wild things that we have in our, in our local fishing right now, where if you're on a, a trip that can travel, you know, 100 miles, anything, anything's possible. 100%. Joel Lopez wants to know a good way to store a fishing rod in an apartment when you have a nine foot jig stick and pretty thick for the thin Amazon rod holder. Um, probably just put it up in a corner, but maybe stand it up as, as vertical as possible. You really don't want it leaning. So you might have to put it outside the rod holder and just leaning up um, somewhere there. I know that, that um, some guys will make like these kind of more horizontal type rod holders. Uh, with some of those hooks that you can buy like at Home Depot or something like that, but that may not work for what you're doing. If you already have vertical rod holders going, um, that's the way I would go is just stand it up in a corner, but you don't want it leaning with a whole lot of weight because it'll kind of take a set. Isaac Parcell has a problem with Dan Lightfoot also. I have a problem with him not giving me 
being the specificity I need as a reporter to connote the information to my public. So, Can you just let him connote, please? Yes, please. <laughs> um, yes. Um, I told Scott uh, that he was exacerbating the situation the other day, and he said, I don't do that. <laughs> and I said, yes, you, you've exacerbated this whole thing. And he said, Dear, you're a weirdo. Stop talking like that. <laughs> anyway, uh, let's see. Uh, Isaac says, Sam, do you have the sand bass jig heads? Dan Lightfoot wouldn't share his when we went out fishing on the Spitfire. Yeah, Dan Lightfoot. Boy, that Dan Lightfoot house, <laughs> whatever it is. Yeah, we got them here. It's mostly those banana heads, I think, is what they're using. Uh, but, we, yeah, we got them here in all the, the, the lime color and the orange color and the white. So, yeah, no problem. Balboa Fish Group says, hit that like button, and we couldn't agree more and can't thank you enough for your great support. Raul says, what's up, guys? Sam, do you have any call CalStar blanks looking for an 800 M if you do how much? I don't have that one in stock right now. Uh, we're going to see if we can try to have some of that stuff for the show, um, but at the moment we don't. Um, and, and I would imagine, Raul, um, you know, and I know this is kind of a tough, a tough pitch here, but even if we did have it at the show, you're probably going to have to be there the first day and probably the first hour. That 800M is probably one of the most sought after blanks here um, at the moment. So if I have them, I'm probably not going to have 50 of them. I'll probably have three or four or five at the most. So I would imagine they'll be the first to go. So so could he call you and say, hey, no. here's 100 bucks? And yeah. Oh, no, because no. you don't want to, yeah. yeah. What if you don't get them? Or, yeah, yeah. yeah. At the, you know, we get asked that all the time. If I did that, he would he would give me a hundred bucks and I'd give him the blank in about five years. Oh yeah. Because he'd probably have fifty guys in front of him that already give him gave me a hundred bucks. Oh, you're right. It's just yeah, it would just create a mess. Many. Yeah, it's just one of those things. I don't like taking people's money if I don't think I can get it in. Gotcha. A, in, in a reasonable amount of time. Yeah. So, going to the show, that's probably going to be your next opportunity. But I would venture to say on a blank like that, it's a very common blank. It's one blank that pretty much everybody can use, and so you just you know, are, are looking at a blank that's, uh, even at the show, you'd probably have to be one of the first couple of people at the booth to even get something, so. All right, very good. Uh, Joel Lopez says, what rod and reel setups and line do you guys run in your arsenal? Personally, top to bottom question, question for both of you guys. I will defer to Sam on that one. <laughs> top to bottom, huh? Yes. Um, yeah, I use so much, you know. I mean, it, it's a pretty long question. I mean, as far as, Depends on where I'm going to go fishing, you know, I mean, um, you know, half day boat's going to be different than an 11 day trip, you know, so um, I don't really have like a, a brand preference. I don't know if you're looking for that, um, you know, either way. So that's kind of a long winded answer that that depending on what kind of fishing you're going to be talking about may may give me a whole different answer. So, Joel, I think that's one of those that if you um, wanted to come down to the shop, um, definitely can help you out with that. But. For this purpose here, you know, there's so many different possible scenarios. I could probably go on for about an hour just talking about the different scenarios. Well, go ahead. The football game's screwed <laughs> anyway at this point. No, I'm kidding. Yeah, yeah. All right, perfect. Um, uh, Rob S. Phil, Albacore prediction 2024. Oh, yeah. I will be pontificating on that next week. We All will right. have the way too early Albacore forecast prediction messed up, screwed up. Uh, <laughs> They're buying Whatever this year. it is, They're yeah, buying this year for 2024 next week, Rob. <laughs> thank you for checking up on me, Frankie Sanchez. Hey, Frankie, what's up? Hey, fellas, I'm trying to build up my arsenal. So far, I've a Kuma eight foot, twenty to fifty pound. I plan on going after a few big tuna this year. Any rod and reel recommendations? Thanks in advance. Thank you, Frankie, for joining us. Yeah, Frankie, you know Akuma makes a nice uh, seven and a half. But um, like 60 to 100, I think it's their 2X rod. And you could probably pair that up with either, like uh, like I was mentioning earlier, with a larger Fathom or Speedmaster um, 20, something like that would be good. That's probably where I would go on a more of a budget setup. Um, if you want to go on something a little bit more high end, you know, we have that CalStar United Composite Seeker and maybe like a uh, International or Makaira 16 or 20 would be the way I would go. All right, sounds good. Um, let's see. Rob says, I have a bunch of 30-year-old yo-yo irons. Uh, should I update with newer jigs? No. No, as long as, it, I mean, a lot of those jigs are probably the same exact jigs that we sell today. You know, you might have some jigs that maybe are too big or too small, but, you know, most of those yo-yo irons are going to be, now, yo-yo used to be a brand of a jig, so I'm not sure if you're talking about those specific jigs, but 
if you're talking about yo-yo jigs, meaning like 6X Juniors, 6Xs, Taddy 4Os, and things like that, I think you're fine. Um, as far as yo-yo fishing for yellowtail, I think you'll be just fine. All right, Sean Sarkisian. Don't forget, January 21st at his place, La Fogata in Sherman Oaks. One to three, we will be there. He's got a new product coming out soon that will help charter fishermen get the best bait possible to catch the fish you're after. Sounds like we're going to have to do a podcast on yeah. that one, huh? There you go. Yep, sounds great. Can't wait. Looking forward to promoting that. Joe Lopez, what's your most fishiest local jetty or local fishing spot for calico spotties or sand bass that you can get to walking if you had to recommend to somebody? Good question, Joel. I hope you have a good answer. Yeah. <laughs> well, um, the best is, is different on different days. You know, I mean, you know, those fish, one of the things that's nice about them, they swim around, and so some days they're biting here, some days they're biting there. Um, I would say Long Beach, maybe, uh, you know, uh, Shoreline Village is probably going to be a place that I would start looking. Um, but, you know, it's not a place that bites every single day all the time. As far as being able to walk to it, depends on how far you can walk. I know some of the guys that do a lot of that, um, you know, shoreline fishing, you know, uh, those jetties can sometimes be a long walk on the jetty itself before you get into some good fishing. So um, it really depends on, on how far you can go. But um, a couple of the guys here, Matt and, and Andrew and Blake, do some of that kind of jetty fishing as well. You might want to come down and talk to those guys. But, uh, you know, those kinds of questions, what is the best place that I can go? Is, uh, is 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 a hard one to answer because it changes all the time. Yeah, and so I hate I hate answering that question with one spot because you go there, you go there and the conditions guy, are bad. Yeah, and the guy's lying. You know, I don't catch yeah. nothing here. You know, and then yeah. I go the next week and I catch fish, and they're like, "You didn't catch anything there. I didn't catch nothing two weeks ago when I went." It's like, well, it just doesn't work that way, you know. But uh, but that'd probably be a place I would like. I know uh, uh, that Pierre J. I know a lot of guys go yeah, fish over there. Yeah, tons of guys fish. Yeah. Yeah, 72nd Street Jetty is a popular place for yep. fishing halibut. You know, Redondo Beach Breakwall, I mean, right now you couldn't fish there because of all the big big, big uh, swell. But, I mean, mm -hmm. historically it's been a great fishing spot, too. Oh, yeah. Uh, Topaz Jetty, another place that's really good. I've caught a lot of halibut and bass off of that jetty there. Those probably wouldn't be a very safe place to fish at the moment. But throughout the year, those are all good places. Yep, very good. Great question. Thank you so much, Joel. Steve Bermudez is going to educate you on breakaway tackle. It's located okay. in Corpus Christi in the heart of the Texas coastline. Sounds like he's in Wikipedia. Uh, <laughs> Nick Meyer is the owner. Nick specializes in surf fishing. Okay. Steve's yeah. trying to butter Nick up for a free jig or something, sounds like, right? <laughs> All right, very good. Thank you, Steve. We appreciate that. I'll mention that on the morning briefing. No, I won't. Uh, let's see. Rob wants to know if I'm planning a guided trip to Mexico coast fishing. I really want to do that, man. I should do that. Cool. How, what? Just thinking out loud with me here. Would you care of it? Is, would you? Because you're gonna have people that have not been to Mexico. Say, so would you say we're gonna meet at the border and then caravan in? I would, would you? To me, I, I, I think the best way to do it is is maybe. I mean, it depends on how far you want to go. Let's but, say if we were gonna go. But yeah, the way I would question. do it yeah. is probably just hit up either Rosarito and Sonata. Yeah. Get a hotel. Yep. And that's where you're going to stay. That's going to be your base. Right. And then start fishing the next day. You know, any of those beaches right there. Right. So that's... I think like Ensenada, you're for a little bit further down there. Yeah, that's fine. So yeah. do, do the people drive there or do oh, we yeah. organize a bus? Because I know some guys on the other side of the border that would... I think that'd be fine. Yeah, you can organize a bus. For people that are a little leery about driving. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think people that are leery about driving probably wouldn't go anyway. Yeah. You know, but a bus might just make it more convenient for somebody. I don't know how, if there's any kind of like... You know, immigration logistical things that you'd have to kind of account for that might make it tougher to organize a trip that way, but yeah. I'm sure it's doable. Yeah. yeah, well, Rob, let me know. But yeah, I think so. We just caravan down to Ensenada. I think Sam's right. And then, shoot, you can go, you know, you can jump on a, a sport boat one day too. You know, they have down at, yeah. on the Malicom there. They still well, have It depends on how many there. days you want to do it, but I mean, yeah. even like. Probably a weekend to start, right? Yeah, or something yeah. Like that. I would say like one or two days would be the most I'd want to do. Yeah. You know, you'd probably have to go down there and scout it out a few times. So I'm going might, this weekend. You might have to go down there and fish seven or eight times. Oh, you yeah. Where to go, you know. Heartbreak, RD, huh? you know, yeah. <laughs> I'll be down there this weekend. find somebody to go with you. Yeah, I've, I've got tons of people. <laughs> uh, yeah, you want to go? Not me. I, I'm busy that weekend. <laughs> oh, you dirty rat, you. Let me tell you. Rob, uh, I need to work on that. Keep pushing me on that. And if you have any suggestions, what would make it more comfortable for you, that'd be great. Joel Lopez 
says, thanks for answering all the questions. Got to keep you guys on your toes. Pull out all the knowledge I can. Joe, we love it, man. Thank you. All the stories and tips have helped me catch more fish and be a better angler. Joel, yeah, thank Joel. you, man, right? Thanks, man. We really, really appreciate having you as part of the show. Steve Bermudez, eh, on the other hand, <laughs> I don't know. No, I love Steve. Uh, Steve says, polarized lenses, <coughs> while well, I choked to death, excuse me. Uh, polarized lenses will keep you out of tangles and keep your eyes safe from jigs and hooks, yellow lenses for early morning or overcast days, and late evening dark lenses for the rest of the day. Um, and uh, that tackle company is in Corpus Christi okay. in the heart of, what was it, Texas? Texas. Yeah, there you are. Yeah, All right, yeah. thank you, Steve. Steve P. Oh, Puckett. Puckett. Oh, my gosh. Oh, Steve Puckett. Yeah. Woo! Remember that guy? Kind of. I, I know the name. Yeah, who is it? Steve Puckett. Yeah, he was he was, he was was a big fan of yours back in the day. Yeah. He fished a lot of trips with you. Steve, I love you. A lot of trips. Of course trips. I remember you. Yeah, yeah. 976 I, Tuna Dates. You did yeah. a lot of fishing. How do you know all this? I've known Steve for a long time. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Probably and 20 years. Has he ever been on our show before? He has a comment? No, boy. Uh, on the show, I don't think so. Steve, welcome. He's a good, he's a good dude. Yeah, I man. I got to get we... that guy fishing. I fished a lot, a lot of trips with him. Okay, great. Yeah, yeah. We got to get him out with us. Yep, yep. He'd be great. Is there a New Year's code? Breadman backlashes? <laughs> I like it. So Breadman is uh, Chris's uh, nickname. Chris Navarro? Chris Navarro. He used to work for a, a, a bread company, Puritan and Bre No, what that? Well, I'm sure Chris can tell me. So we called him Breadman because he would slip us a... A, a loaf of bread once in a while? Well, a loaf of bread, but you know, some nice, like some cinnamon rolls. Ooh. Uh, Steve used to work at Baja with me. Oh, so okay. So step by and... Oh, I know. Yeah, I know yeah, who you're talking yeah, about yeah, now. Yeah. yeah. He'd butter us up with the cinnamon rolls or Does something Does Chris like that. still work for that? No, he's retired. Oh, so we don't have yeah. to kiss up to him? No, right? no, yeah. yeah. You, have to, you have to give him Come on, Chris. Don't you have that contact anymore? <laughs> Wait a minute. I don't eat that crap unless you make it out of prime rib. <laughs> Back then, though, yeah, it was good. Yeah, perfect. All right. Are you giving away a thing tonight? Uh, we'll, we'll talk about it. Okay. Actually, yeah, probably not so much going on now, but yeah, we'll talk All right. about it. Perfect. Hal, um, it says, a friend of, of, of me, or a friend of, a friend gave me, I'm sorry, an older CalStar <laughs> 60 to 100 rod. It has roller guides. What, I'm starting to read like a moron, can you tell? Mm -hmm. What are the thoughts on roller guides? Well, they're fine. You know, uh, one of the things that, that the newer rods uh, give you an advantage of is that they're typically a little bit stiffer in the middle part of the rod. And they're longer. You know, we're using the rail a lot more now, and so um, it, and you have that longer rod. It allows you to kind of, kind of back up from the rail a little bit, and that's why it's stiffer in the middle, and still be able to keep a fish <laughs> out away from the boat. With these older rods, if you were to step back in the same way, you're basically the rod's going to bend right, almost parallel to the boat, maybe only a foot away from the boat, or less. And so, when you get a fish close to the boat, and it starts doing its circles, you're going to have a harder time keeping it out away from the boat. So. Not that it won't do it, it should probably be strong enough, but um, definitely not the rollers is not going to be the problem, but more than likely, if it's an older Calstra rod, it's probably going to be a shorter rod, a five and a half or six foot, and probably going to be um, just, not that it won't do the job, but it won't do it as good as a modern rail rod would. Um, so that, that'd be my comment on that. I mean, the roller guides are fine, though. All right, Steve wants to drop off a couple of golden oh, wings man. on you. Why, why didn't Steve come down and have... He should. I told him if he comes down, the wings are paid for, but... Yeah, no, wants, yeah, he can pay yeah. for them. No, he, I'll pay for them. Oh. Yeah, Steve, yeah. Steve, come down. But I'm saying that because I know for sure 100%. He won't show. He won't show. Oh, why? What <laughs> yeah. does he do? He, it, he's like a vampire at night or something? He's, he's in his coffin? Or what? I, just, I just know his tendencies. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh-oh. <laughs> I don't want to get into that, actually. <laughs> All right, Steve. We'll see you. Come uh, on down, Steve. SoCal wing, Steve. Come you, on. If you come down right now, you're I'll give you a hug and a kiss of when you walk in the door. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that'll yeah. do it, right? He'll never show up. And his wife, Sharon, she's Awesome, awesome. If you, you saw, you probably remember her too. They used to both go down to the meetings that you used to have at the. Uh, Damn, yeah. At the, uh, at the, the sports bar over there. Come on, yeah. Steve. And she fished with them too a lot of years. Yeah. A lot of trips, I mean, on, on the 976. Oh, shoot, trips, man. Yeah. That'd be great. We're going to get them back out if now. If you with saw them. them both, you'd recognize them. Uh, super I... cool, super cool people. All right, Steve, come on. Kim Herbert, other than circle hooks and J hooks, are there any specific hooks I need to have for that five day trip? With Friedman Adventures, <laughs> departing April 4th and fishing to the 9th. No, no, as far as those are, those are basically the only two types of hooks you can get. The biggest thing that you're going to probably need is going to be a variety of sizes. And then as we mentioned, I think, um, before is 
is maybe even different um, thicknesses of hooks. So you might even think of a maybe a slightly lighter wire hook for some finesse fishing, but um, but the size of the hook's probably going to be a bigger deal. All right, perfect. Balboa Jetty and Newport Harbor. Balboa Fish Group says are other great choices. Rob S. Yeah, let's meet at the border to plan visa and such. Safe direction to our location. Yeah, I think you meet mm -hmm. like before the border somewhere and yeah. do your thing. And uh, yeah, we'll figure this out. We got to do this for sure. Um, uh, Patrick says, I would 100% be in on a drive trip to Mexico with Phil. Right on, man. This is going to be fun. We're going to go through Tecate, and we're going to go to my carne asada place, Los Amigos, and you're going to get spoiled on the best carne asada you could ever imagine in your life and get hungry just thinking about it. <laughs> and then good. go through the wine country. Man, there's just you're way too... You're never going to get there. <laughs> I know, really. Fishing? Yeah. We're, we're eating, you know, 24 <laughs> hours a day. All right. Hey, I got to work on this, obviously. Uh, Steve says, let's go fishing. Let's do it, Steve. We'll talk about it when you come over for... Uh, for um, uh, whatever it is you're coming over for. Wings. Wings. Michigan 20, Washington 13, oh, fourth quarter. Sounds like a good game. We're going to miss. Uh, Entenmann's. That is like the the kind of stuff. The, the... Entenmann's. Yeah, that's who you used to work at. Yeah. Oh, oh okay. That, yeah, yeah. yeah they have good stuff. Down. Steve. Or, or, uh, Steve. What Chris. is your name again? <laughs> yeah, no, I'm talking to you. Sam, i got three more comments. All right. Um, thoughts on uh, Jigging Master. What picked up? Just picked up. Uh, just picked up. A pen 10. No, PE 10. PE That's the 10. size of a reel, yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, I mean, you know, those seem to be tried and true. I know a lot of the guys who are really into the jigging have picked those up. Um, as far as I've seen, they've been solid. And so I think you should have good luck with that. Hey, uh, Christopher Navarro says, uh, Steve Pocket, Sam, I am. I'm down for some fun fishing. Steve says they're on their way down. Uh, yeah, Is right. that a BS thing? Yeah, right. <laughs> 100%. Uh, he says 27-13 now. Oh, man. And then 26. Oh, 26-13, I guess? Yeah, Whatever. Maybe they missed an extra point or something. Maybe. Who knows? All right. What can I say? Sam, Sam what is the, do, you, do you have a deal or not? I think we're okay, out of here. So we're almost the, out of here. Here's the deal. For, for now, I'm going to say everybody. this. Thanks, everybody. Yep. The shows are coming up here in a couple weeks, so we're going to save all of our deals for then. And maybe what, some of the things that we can do is, is just let you know that we're going to have probably some of the best prices on – on, on, a, on some rods and reels, um, you know, and we're doing the best to, we can do to kind of gather up what we can as far as just inventory for, for taking to the show. So I really urge you guys to come down to the show. Um, it's going to be the 25th through the 28th, January, Long Beach Convention Center. We're going to have a big giant booth. And last year we had the biggest booth we've ever had. I think we're doing the same size booth this year. Nice. And so we're going to be down there loaded and ready to give you guys some good deals. That sounds great, Sam. Um, are we doing this show next Monday? Or uh, do you so. know? Or what's the? Or is that going to screw you up on getting ready for the show and everything? No, or? probably not. I think we'll be all right. Okay, perfect. Um, why don't you say goodbye? I think we might see a little bit yeah, of the game. Yeah, we might see it. Yeah. Why don't you tell everybody where you're located, give so, a phone number, and we'll yeah, get the heck at, out of here. 21809 Avalon Boulevard, City of Carson. Uh, phone number here is 310-707-1205, and we're open Monday through Friday. From 10 to 6, you can reach me uh, there. You can email me, sam at islandfishingdackle.com, or on Instagram or Facebook. We have a, face, uh, a, a page there as well. Thanks for joining us, everybody. Sam, always a pleasure, man. Lots of fun. See you at the wing place, Steve. All right, yeah, we'll see all of you at the wing place. Take care, everybody. Thanks for joining us. All right. Really appreciate it. Cool. We're out of here. Almost out of here. As soon as I can turn this off, everybody's still listening to Put us. Put the game back on.